get this show going so we can enjoy the holidays as soon as we can, right? Uh, before I call the meeting to order, I want to make sure everyone knows there is some great hot chocolate that I apparently made somebody do, but um, actually I think Doug did, Vaughn told somebody to make that. Thank but, you, Jayla. But please, Butter, it is actually really good. Enjoy it. We're having a fun night. Let's just get through the night and have a, a great evening. So I'll call to order the Board of Directors Wednesday, December 18th meeting. And now will you rise for the Pledge of Allegiance? Pledge of Allegiance. The flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, everybody. Uh, roll call, please, Melinda. Thank you, Mr. Chair. In your ugly sweater. <laughs> my very ugly sweater. <clears throat> Maybe I could turn my All right. Out. Eva Henry. Uh, Adams County, Steve Odorizio here. All right. She would say it. I, I, I was going to say that next, <laughs> but thank you, sir. <laughs> you know, we're, we're excited to have you here, Steve. I'm glad you, <laughs> made sure you announced you were here. You did not get the memo, though, on the sweater. <laughs> okay, Jeff Baker. Here. Bill Holland. Elise Jones. Here. Deb Garner, William Lindstedt, Heidi Hankel, Randy Wheelock, George Marlin, Nicholas Williams, Here. Kevin Forget, Kevin Flynn, Here. Joan Clark, Roger Pat Partridge, sorry, Here. Laura Thomas, Ron Angles, Libby Zabo, Casey Ty, Bob Pfeiffer, Here. John Marriott, Bob Roth, Allison Hiltz, Larry Vidham, sure. David Spellman, Aaron Brockett, Present. Sam Weaver, Margot Ramsden, Lynn Baca, Here. Matt Johnston, Roger Hudson, Ben Price, Roger Teal. Uh, George Teal. Yeah, that one. Uh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> My apologies. Watch that. Partridge. It could have been George, George Partridge. It could have been George yeah. Partridge. Again. Yeah. So sorry. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> All right. In a couple months. It could be. We won't want that. Many. <laughs> well, I mean, it might be fine. But, yeah. <laughs> Jason Gray. Tammy Maurer. Here. Terry Penaloza. Jeremy Fay. Randy Wheel. Here. Russell Stewart. Richard Champion. Gail Christie. Nicole Frank. Present. Craig Hurst, Jackie Thomas, Catherine Whitman, Steve Conklin, Here. Kara Swanson, Linda Olson, Here. Cheryl Wink, Bill Gipp, Drew Peterson, Bobby Sindelar, Lisa Jones, Laura Brown, Lynette Kelsey, Here. Keith Holmes, Rachel Binkley, Ryan Tushare, Jim Dale, Oh, oh, there we go. <laughs> Paul Hasseman, George Lance, Here. Mike Hillman, Stephanie Walton, Hello. Alexander Lynch, Dana Gutwein, Jacob LeBure, Isaac Levy, Karina Elrod, Kyle Schlachter, Larry Strock, Present. Jacob Lofgren, Quinn Shaw, here. Jackie Malay, Joan Peck, Marsha Martin, Ashley Stolzman, Here. Deborah Fahey, Connie Sullivan, Barney Dreistat, Joyce Palazuski, 
Colleen Whitlow, Paul Sutton, Sean Ferre, Chris Larson, Julie Duran Mullica, Joyce Downing, John Dyack, Here. Josh Rivero, Sally Daigle, Dave Black, Sandy Hammerly, Clint Folsom, Jessica Sandgren, Jack Phillips, Herb Atchison, yes. Anita Seitz, Bud Starker, Present. Adam Zarin, Here. Rebecca White, Bill Van Meter. Here. I'm, I'm sure we have a quorum, so thank you very much. I'd like to also introduce some new members. Nicole Frank from uh, City of Commerce City. Yep. Hey. Also, William uh, Linstead uh, from the City and County of Broomfield. Also, some new alternates, uh, Junie Joseph from City of Boulder. I think I saw her earlier. Uh, Craig Hurst from the City of Commerce City. Heidi Hinkle from the City and County of Broomfield. That's Heidi Hinkle. There you are. And Anita Seitz from the City of Westminster. For joining this awesome team, and we're looking forward. Am I missing somebody else? Yes, ma'am. City of Thornton also has a new alternate, Julia Marvin. Making a note. Thank you very much. Um, next up, I have moved to approve the agenda. I have a second. Okay. All in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? Hands and carries. Uh, next up is our community spotlight of the great city of Louisville. Oh, sorry. All right, can you? Can Sorry, I was out of order. Oh. I have a quick video to show the board. Send your bills that you, that, I mean, you're definitely going to need counseling after that. So send all receipts to Bob Pfeiffer so he'll pay for it.
has some job openings in the morning. <laughs> if anybody's interested, just please let me know. Uh, the chair asked for this to be played, okay. so uh, no one's at fault but myself. But uh, I heard the staff enjoyed that, and I appreciate the leadership to have a little humor during the holidays when we can all use it. <laughs> so moving right along, now to the great city of Louisville. Thank you. So next year, we want a live performance. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you all for having me t tonight to talk about the Community Spotlight for Louisville. So I, I could talk about Louisville for four hours, or five hours to six hours, but I'm going to try to stay to five minutes or 10 minutes. Um, this slide just sort of talks about <clears throat> there's so many different things we do in local government. I don't have to tell you all that. Um, up in the top left, you can see we have a very unique historic preservation program in Louisville. Um, we actually, it's totally voluntary, and we still get a lot of participation because because the citizens of Louisville have decided to tax themselves so we can give real financial incentives to businesses and to houses to be able to spruce up their homes and landmark them so we can give up to $200,000 to businesses who want to landmark so it's an economic development and preservation program that's very unique. Um, we have a golf course, we have a rec center. Sometimes you have to do things in local government <clears throat> that aren't very fun so we do about 70 re-roofs a year and then something like this happens. And in one year, you suddenly have to do over 4,200 re-roof permits, and people want to know why you're not there the same day doing the re-roof permit. So you quickly have to adjust. You have to be agile. There's all different kinds of things we do. Come to Louisville. We'll go to lunch. It'll be fun. Today, I'm going to talk about transportation. This is a picture of a flood. So <clears throat> what ends up happening is that you, we're a small community. Our unrestricted general fund budget is about $10 million. And sometimes something like this happens. And in this picture, there is no river, really. So this is just where the water was during the flood. You can see the trees in the background. There's a little creek that right now, if you go past it, there's absolutely no water in it. Typically, there's no water in it. But in 2013, <clears throat> right when I got elected, this is what we were dealing with. So sometimes you have really good plans, and you have a lot of different things you want to do. But in local government, you have to respond to what you're given also. So I'm going to talk about transportation tonight because that's what we deal a lot with. And the transportation in our community is also used by all ages and abilities, Jayla. So I'm also talking about aging, don't worry. <laughs> but back, <clears throat> this is probably about four years ago now, on a Friday, a member of our community started putting signs around town that are in the top left corner. So other members of the community got very upset um, because it made you cuss in your head. And so, <clears throat> so these signs were put everywhere. And at council the following Tuesday, we actually happened to already have planned a transportation discussion about slowing traffic down. But the community members who put the signs out didn't know that. So they then thought we were the most responsive city council of all time. <laughs> and it was awesome because we already had engineering plans and drawings for improvements. We already had a discussion scheduled. We already had budgeted about $300,000 to spend to work on this. So we just became the most responsive council of all time. And we let them believe that. <laughs> um, so I'm just tying this back. This, this is just an update on how we've been dealing with neighborhood speeding. It's sort of our local version of the Vision Zero program that we've been working on here in Denver and at Dr. Cog. Um, so local communities, a lot of the local communities, if you look at the CDOT data, already are achieving Vision Zero because we have low volumes and low speeds. And that's a recipe for lower number of impacts, right? Um, but that doesn't mean it's without problems. So what we did in Louisville is that a number of intersections that are on routes to school, we've added these crossings to try to improve the, the, the environment for people that are walking and biking. So in some cases, it's just paint at a crossing. And in other places, we've actually done concrete work. So there's an, an additional median in the middle. Um, <clears throat> we also rebranded the campaign so people didn't have signs with cuss words anymore. So <laughs> we, we gave out signs that are about Little Lou, and there's a poem. It's very sweet. Um, so you might say, OK, you did all of this stuff. Did it do anything, Ashley? Why did you do all of this stuff? So here's our before and after data. So this is our big speeding problem in Louisville. Don't make fun of me. Um, so these are the 85th percentiles before that we did anything. And we had a huge problem and a lot of concern. And so after we installed our improvements, you can see the 85 percentiles afterward. And so we did actually see a statistical difference in the speed of traffic on the road. The perception also from people is that it feels a lot more comfortable crossing. And so that's really important, too, because if it feels comfortable, then people are willing to use the crossing. 
I will say that it is fascinating. People hit these medians all the time. So if you're a pedestrian, be very careful. Um, so you might want to wonder what the cost, <clears throat> for, for something of the magnitude of we what we did, we think this is relatively inexpensive to have the, the results that we've seen. Um, so you can see our original set of crossings was around $230,000. It was popular, so we had to add in some additional crossings. People felt like that we left out, that we missed from our original set. And the outreach campaign was about $15,000, just under. So the outreach campaign we did, um, Barbecues, back to school barbecues. We let the kids paint the street. We fed people. We told them how to cross the street. We told them how to get to school. It was fun. And we put out those yard signs. So all in all, it was just under $300,000. And you can see it was a really good community engagement activity and a good disbursement of activity around the town. So we were able to lower, lower the speeds and get people out there walking and biking. So the next transportation project I'm going to talk about is repaving. So when I got elected in 2013, there was a big flood. And so that took a lot of money and time and effort. All at the same time, our streets were in a state of total disrepair. We had alligator cracking on a huge number of streets, um, residential streets. And for the CDOT people in the room can probably tell you more about this than I can, but this is the very most expensive time to have to address a street is when it's totally failed. So just, just to remind you, we have this huge flood. At the same time, we did a community survey and people said that maintaining, repairing, and repaving the streets is the highest funding priority for our local municipal funds. So our city council took it very seriously, and we tried to come up with a plan that we could try to get a handle on how we could repave the streets, because as you all know, maintaining infrastructure is very expensive, and it continues to escalate with construction inflation. So this is a graph that I've stolen from another community, and you can see many, many versions of this graph if you go online. But what this shows you is um, this is sort of a curve looking at pavement age, and then you can see the cost over here of replacement. So if you can actually get to repaving your placement up here in the green and just doing a coating over the top of it, you can extend the life. And so you'll see sometimes this graph will be changed with a little thing up here that just shows if you stay up there and you get to it before it fails, you're going to save yourself money in the long run. The problem is a lot of our pavement was already down here in this most expensive section. And once it's gotten there, it can't get any worse. It's already failed. And so what some people will do is just let the failed pavement sit and continue to address the good streets because then you'll keep your score high. So <clears throat> we went around, we got a van, it wasn't that one, but we got a van and we drove around and we looked at streets and we normed our streets and said, what is right, and what's fair? Um, so the city council said, we're going to have <clears throat> goals and objectives. We're going to have targets that we meet. We're going to start tracking this over time to see what this is costing us per square yard. We're going to make sure that we have all handicap accessible um, sidewalks on the side, make sure everything's ADA on the side. And we want to know what this is going to cost us if we don't have any streets that are below a pavement condition index of 35. And so the 35, oh, I broke everything. <laughs> The 35 was based on going into the different neighborhoods and everybody agreeing that nobody's grandmother should have to live on a street that looked like that. And we decided that was unacceptable for our community and it didn't meet the values that we were seeing in the community survey. We also want to keep all of our, our other targets at 75. That'll help us actually have the most cost-effective street resurfacing program we can. But in order to do this, everyone had to be able to like, pull up their bootstraps, really you know, have a high intestinal fortitude, because this is not inexpensive, particularly if you want to address those alligator cracking streets all while you're maintaining your good streets. And then we wanted to have it across our arterials, collectors, um, and whatever else. The other thing I want to tell you is that when you say, OK, we're going to do this, you have to remember there's stuff under the streets. So if you're going to go in and have this major streets program, you have to think about what that's going to do to your water utility. So we had to overlay with our water utility and understand what our replacement for our water mains, our sewers, and all of that was, because the last thing you want to do is repave all your streets and then tear all your streets up. People won't like that. Um, so you can see here, this is a water main break actually on a very nice street, so that was sort of sad. But that's get, that, that will happen. We have ductile iron pipes. It's the age of the infrastructure, so that kind of thing is bound to happen. Anyway, what you can see that we've, we've had to do, <clears throat> so back in 2015, we were still dealing with flood repair, so our budget couldn't be as high as we wanted it to to address our goals and get to our outcomes. 
But you can see what we've done is we still maintain this about $2 million a year for our regular resurfacing program. And then just because we think we're cute, we called the other program No Streets Left Behind. <laughs> so, so for the No Streets Left Behind program, we almost had to double our budget. And we're on track by about 2024 or 2025 to hit our goal of having no streets below that 35 and all of the streets on average at a 75 pavement condition index. So the next city council can say to us, thank you very much. Um, so just to kind of another way of looking at our progress, you can see, unfortunately, what happens, these blue bars, can, the streets continue to get worse. You can't just fix one and then it's better forever. They continue to age. But you can see we've really made progress getting more streets into this excellent category and getting streets out of this poor category. And like I say, this is the most expensive area. And those are the ones that neighborhoods and residents are just furious about those streets. So we're working on it. And now we have a bunch of streets that look like this. So it's really exciting. And then the last thing I want to tell you about is just another transportation-related program we've been working on. We've done our first ever transportation master plan. And this is sort of my favorite graphic from the whole plan because we can use this to communicate to our residents. So these red areas are places people might want to go. It's our downtown and the bus station. And the other colors of red show you how long it would take to get there on bike. So like this area, everybody who lives in this area can get to the bus stop in five minutes on their bike on average. That's awesome. Everybody can get to the rec center within 10 minutes on their bike. That's crazy. And people just don't realize that. We have great bike paths. We have a great bike, net bike network on street. Um, and so just being able to communicate to people that really it's only going to take you 10 minutes for real to get there on your bike, it can help us make that mode shift over. So I've been biking. Thank you, and I'll take any questions if anyone has any. These are other non-transportation things in our city. <laughs> Thank you, Director Stolzman. Any questions for her? Yeah, I was just down there uh, a few weeks ago. Great job. They're doing a wonderful job in that town, and it's, it's definitely vibrant. Um, next month, uh, we've selected two other communities to present, uh, Douglas County. There's Roger, okay. And the other one will be Inglewood. Um, Thank you, Doug. <laughs> Douglas, yeah. Um, so if you can take it back to your staff and be prepared to give us a little snapshot of your community. Uh, moving right along, report from the chair. I would like to introduce uh, Bill Thibault, the commissioner or CDOT commissioner is the current chairman of the uh, CDOT Commission and represents District 10 in Pueblo, a position he has held since August 2013. Commissioner Tebow, an attorney, served in the Colorado General Assembly from 1987 to 2002, first as a member of the House of Representatives until 1993, and then as state senator. Uh, Commissioner Tebow is also an adjunct uh, faculty member in the Political Science Department at CSU Pueblo and is former Pueblo County Public Trustee and District Attorney. He is here tonight. If you'd like to come up and uh, speak with the Board of Directors, that would be wonderful. Thank you very much. Well, well thank you very much. Um, I will be as brief as possible because I know you have some very important work to do. I watched the you know, films about all the Macarena dancing and things like that, so <laughs> I can report back to the uh, commission that you are very busy attending to important work, um, which is good. I, I don't think I've heard so much laughter since I left home. One thing that wasn't mentioned is my wife and I have 15 children and 39 grandchildren, and then when you add significant others and spouses and my sister and so on, we have 75 people in our immediate family. So this reminds me of our Thanksgiving dinner. <laughs> uh, maybe it's a little smaller than our Thanksgiving dinner. And you know, we fight a lot, so I like all the laughter. That's great. But listen, thank you very much for allowing me to, to visit with you tonight. Um, the reason I came here is because the Transportation Commission is now made up of, um, I think, five new members. Uh, when I started six and a half years ago, uh, of course there's 11 members, but when I started uh, six and a half years ago, uh, it, was a, it was a group that I became accustomed to working with, and then all of a sudden, uh, 
the terms of you know m many of them expired and and uh, the governor the current governor governor polis had the opportunity to uh, appoint um, a good portion of the commission and so when i was asked to be the chair of the commission about six months ago i basically said to those veteran commissioners who were still on board that i believed that i needed to concentrate on uh, three areas and as you know the commission generally oversees the transportation policy of the state and formulates the annual budget which nowadays is around two and a half billion dollars um, but I I told the commissioners that were um, asking me to be chair that really I wanted to concentrate on a few things the first thing I wanted to concentrate on of course was our recommitment as a commission to safety and um, we had never given up that commitment. It's always been involved in any kind of decisions that I've been a part of. Safety has always been an integral part of, of those decisions. Um, another thing that I mentioned was that we needed to start thinking about the future. And the future can't be had without remembering the past. And so what I was trying to get started was what I call a mobility systems approach to the statewide transportation issues that we all face here in Colorado. And that, that goes for maintaining our system, our road system, our infrastructure that we're used to, both in the urban and rural areas. And then along the spectrum, it goes toward the future. You know, what kind of transportation systems are we going to be able to deal with in our communities, both urban and rural? Everybody has different uh, needs. Everybody has different desires. And we have this enormous problem of, uh, of uh, greenhouse gases and climate change and congestion and all those type of things. Um, but what I was trying to, to let the commission know is that we need to stop just going about our business in terms of looking in the rearview mirror, so to speak. That we have to be sure, as I said, we're maintaining our system and that we have good infrastructure throughout our state but we also have to keep an eye on the future. And that balance is very difficult, but you know it can be achieved, and you're probably achieving it greater than anybody else. You, Dr. Cog. Um, I actually have to tell you that when I first became acquainted with Dr. Cog, it was when I was in the legislature, and uh, I was a green uh, representative from Pueblo, and uh, someone asked me, have you met with Dr. Cog? <laughs> And I said, well, what kind of practice does he have? <laughs> and yeah, I thought that I was being told I need to see a doctor, but then I realized the importance of this organization even then in 1987 <coughs> when I first became acquainted with the group. Um, so I, I want you to know that the focus of the commission, at least now for the next six months, and for the previous six months, and really even before that, has understood the delicate balance between urban and rural interests and needs and we listen very carefully to what you say you know the reality is is that the metropolitan area has the political strength and has the votes to get a lot of things done but it's really nice to know that we can work together throughout the state you know i have children in almost every one of your counties or cities so <laughs> i i have to i have to drive up here and use the roads and the facilities and a lot of my children are um, activists in, in the sense of they ride bikes, they walk to, to school, or they walk um, you know, to work. I tell my kids I walk 10 miles to school every day in snow. They don't believe that, but you know, the, the thing of it is, is there's more, than, there's more than a car that can get us around. There's, there's all kinds of, of, of different options, and, and it, it's important for the commission to understand that and to be thinking about those things. And lastly, beyond, and so a mobility to me is more than just, um, you know, electric cars or something like that. Mobility means a variety of things from infrastructure needs all the way to whatever the future holds and everything in between on a statewide basis. Uh, finally, and I'll sit down uh, and let you get back to your, your important work. Um, I, I was trying to tell the commissioners if I'm gonna be chair, we have to do our work in a way that is um, seen by the citizens and, and in reality is done uh, prudently so that the taxpayers know that we are spending their money prudently. How are we going to ever get anything done if the taxpayers of this state 
look at all of us with jaundiced eyes and say, well, you've wasted money or there's extra charges here or you're not keeping, you know, good um, prudent uh, in investments in our system. You're doing some wild, crazy things. So, you know, even though we sometimes work inside baseball, there is a community out there that really, I think, desires transportation from the area that I happen to serve in southeast Colorado, which is a lot of rural communities, all the way through the rest of the state. People need transportation. We need freight to get to Denver. We need people to be able to get on the bus and get to the doctors and to the, to, to the games and to see their relatives from all around the state. You know, we have a lot of recreation in our state that we need to consider. And you know, sometimes it's just nice to take a drive. When I was a, a young boy, my parents used to drive to Colorado Springs every Sunday just to get ice cream. It was a drive, it was a Sunday drive. You know, there's a lot going for us here, but I think ultimately we have to work together. I'm going to sit down, I'm happy to dialogue in any way if, if there's time. I'm happy to see you at the commission meetings. Um, I'm going to be inviting some Dr. Cog groups to join us to uh, either you know, have lunch or dinner or make presentations. We're trying to open that up a little bit more. Uh, we'll be having rail presentations, transit presentations. We've had energy presentations. Um, we had a, a wildlife presentation today. Um, you know, wildlife from the standpoint of um, you know, elk and other critters, not wildlife. <laughs> You know, like how do you party in Denver after hours? Um, although we could probably take a few, you know, pieces of advice from your group. I like this group; it's great. Um, so anyway, that that's kind of what we're doing. I'm trying to be upbeat about it. There's my my term only has six more months. Um, it's really not fun to be a chair of anything, but you know, we all have to. We all have to. <laughs> I'm having fun. But Look at what I got everyone to do. Wear yeah. these crazy sweaters and have hot chocolate. So tomorrow, <laughs> that's what we're going to do. We're all going to wear crazy sweaters and have hot chocolate. <laughs> I hope so. So thank you very much for letting me spend a few minutes with you and look forward to working with you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much. Um, I just want to say from the chair, Thanks for entertaining my ask of wearing a crazy sweater. The staff, I understand, had a great time today and wore your sweaters. And uh, it's good to just relax and have fun a little bit. I like yours, Aaron. It's just black. But that's. I didn't think that would come from Boulder, though. Oh, that, that's as crazy as Boulder gets. <laughs> <laughs> Denver's gray, so you're close. I don't know. But anyways, it, it's a pleasure. It's fun to see everyone dress up and enjoy the holidays. And thank you for entertaining my ask as a chair to enjoy in the festivities. And thank you, Jayla and whoever else, for making great hot chocolate, actually. Who hasn't had it? It is super yummy. I believe it's Mexican hot chocolate. Um, and, and then since I have the microphone, I do want to say to the staff and to the board, I, I'm going to not do it at the end, I'll do it now so we can get out of here soon. You know, have a great holiday, Happy New Year's, be <laughs> safe. It's been a little dangerous in my town for some reason, so don't come to Arvada. Um, <laughs> well, we had a carjacking on Saturday and a police shooting today, so you know, it's not a great day for us. But um, seriously, all seriously, let's enjoy the holidays. Uh, to the staff, to the board, happy holidays. And, and this is one of the best organizations I've ever been associated with and I'm proud of where we were, and I'm looking at some of the older faces around, where we were when I started six, seven years ago to where we are today is leaps and bound better. And that's a combination, I believe, of the board and the board's uh, willingness to collaborate and work together and the support and the, and the, the proficiency of the staff. And every day and every month, I feel we get better and better. And this is what a region works. This is how it works. So I'm really proud to be your chair for the next two or three months um, because this was a great experience. And I encourage anyone to, to run for an executive position because it gives you a different lens to look into. So again, Merry Christmas, Happy Holidays, Happy Hanukkah, uh, and all the other holidays, and Happy New Year's. Moving on to reports from Performance and Engagement Committee. The Performance and Engagement Committee met this evening and 
Um, we talked about the um, 2020 celebration for Dr. Cog, which I can't think of what it's called, and I don't have my notes in front of me. Good job. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Oh, oh, you're done? Oh, gosh. <laughs> Was it? She's dropped. That's your future chair. See how easy that job is? Um, moving right on to reports of Finance and Budget Committee. Thank you. You're really done. Okay. I was questioning Thank the you. same thing, so. All right. Uh, this is a report from the F&B Committee. Uh, we had two action items. One was to appoint our, uh, our payroll uh, vendor, Adiran, uh, LLC as also our attorney, in fact, only for the purpose of uh, uh, communicating with the IRS on payroll and tax matters. Uh, that's a requirement that, uh, that someone be designated uh, that the IRS can talk to. Otherwise, they won't talk to anybody. I know everybody likes talking to the IRS. <laughs> and uh, the second item is a, uh, is a, 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 a contract with preferred community health providers. Is this on? Yeah, okay. it's just a little low. You can never tell with these things. And uh, that is to work with uh, Anthem Commercial Care Transitions on a new program that has the potential to lower health care costs by uh, providing uh, services through our AAA. And uh, there's a possibility that in this first year of this program, which is new here in Colorado, that uh, we could uh, lose up to $35,000 in the startup cost before reimbursements start coming in and, and, and covering the cost. And... Uh, if the, the fact is, though, that if we don't do this, another uh, AAA in the state might be asked to do uh, to do this work and this partnering, and set the tone that we would then be stuck with. So it's better that Dr. Cog engage in this and uh, and sort of set all the precedents for other AAAs to follow than for us to follow someone else. Um, and if it works out in the second year, we would uh, probably be uh, not at risk of, of losing funds. So we approved that also, and that's all we have. Thank you. Next up, we have reports of the executive director. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, and it is good to see everybody, well, several of us, wearing our ugly, uh, ugly, uh, ugly sweaters, our favorite holiday sweater. I think mine's particularly hideous. I can't stand it. And but Mr. <laughs> Mr. Uh -huh. Mr. Chairman, and to quote the uh, great barrister, Vincent LaGuardia Gambini of, of uh, the much acclaimed movie, uh, My Cousin Vinny, I wore this ridiculous ting for you. <laughs> <laughs> Just so you know. And it's, now I'm gonna burn it afterwards. Okay, so, so you may have noticed um, the consent agenda is, is a little beefier this, this meeting than it has been. Typically, we really only had the, uh, the consent agenda on there. Uh, legislative issues, we... Um, we, you know, had a history of putting in the consent agenda. So we, myself and the executive committee, we had a conversation about trying, just trying to streamline the meetings a little bit. I know we're over time tonight, but um, just, just to be respectful of your time and getting you out of here to half decent hours. So what we're looking at doing is putting, for example, like TIP amendments that um, had unanimous approval from both the Transportation Advisory Committee as well as the Regional Transportation Committee or the RTC, putting those on consent. Um, as well as uh, our legislative issues and stuff like that. Um, items that you've had an opportunity to review the meeting or so prior, and if there are no comments of, con you know, of, of any magnitude, putting those on the consent agenda. We also have another item on there this evening that was, quite frankly, is non-controversial with regards to um, funding a project, the Multimodal Options Fund. And we, 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 we told you we were gonna do a call for the, um, the non-urban portion of that uh, several months ago. So, and you guys know, know, know how this all works, of course. I mean, with your protocols at your councils and commissions, you're, you're more than welcome to pull a uh, consent item off the, off the consent docket and we can have a conversation about it. So we're gonna give it a try and see how it goes, but I, and I, I hope it works out uh, <coughs> for you all. The 2020 awards celebration, uh, you have a flyer again. You're gonna, gonna, I'm gonna keep hammering home on this. It's on April 22nd. Uh, at 6 p.m. at Empower Field at Mile High. So please put that on your calendars. Award nominations are open right now in the two primary categories are the MetroVision Awards, which celebrates the projects, initiatives, and plans that, that your communities are implementing, and of course the John B. Christensen Award, which is our most prestigious individual award. And you all recall that former Mayor Centennial Kathy Noon won that last year. So if you have uh, ideas 
or um, thoughts on um, um, anybody who would be you know, a great candidate for the John V. Christian Award, please submit that. You can do everything online associated with our um, applications, and we strongly encourage you to do so. Um, tip post-mortem. As you all know, we just completed our, our 2020 and 2023 tip not that long ago, and um, we are we committed to actually doing an analysis and a white paper associated with that, because as you know, that was a new process for us, our dual tip funding allocation model. Um, so you all, will, you and your staff will be receiving a, a uh, survey from us here in, in the not so distant future. So please just, um, uh, just a heads up on that. Winter Bike to Work Day, which is um, uh, this year is gonna be on February 14th, which is Valentine's Day. Gotta love that. <laughs> gotta love that. <laughs> <laughs> All right, that was that was Steve Erickson's joke anyway, so I'm glad it didn't go over very well. Um, it's as good as your sweater. Goes right, with sweater. Right? Yeah, that's <laughs> exactly <laughs> right. No, so help us get the get the uh, the word out on this. Um, it's actually part of a, it's an international challenge, and we were quite successful in this last year. I don't know, we have what five and how, how many in the top ten, Steve, last year of our community. Yeah, right. So that's pretty impressive. So we'd like to, we want to make sure we uh, we um, we come back successful again and win that sucker. Um, at your desks, you have an updated version of the board handbook. It's the thicker of the stuff that's on your desk. Um, it, this is a great resource for you all, particularly for the newer members here at Dr. Cog. Um, it's a good overview of, uh, of, of what your role as a board director is, um, how we're organized, our major programs, and that are described in there, as well as the committee guidelines, our articles of association, all that kind of good stuff. Cam, our communication and marketing staff, I think have done a tremendous job with this. It looks really, really professional, and, and we're real happy with it. I, I want to point out for the newer, new members of the of the um, of the board that um, myself or someone on staff will be reaching out with you to set up a separate meeting with myself to get a little more in depth into dr. Cox functions and all that kind of thing because we understand that this is uh, you know we're kind of an odd sock in that respect we're we're um, we're not like really anything else and it's it's a it's a lot to to uh, try to comprehend so we want to sit down with you so, so you feel comfortable um, mm -mm. Oh, being the holiday season and all, um, I just want to just point out a couple things that Dr. Cog has been, you know, we've been doing our part this holiday season um, in helping out in the community. Uh, last week, through our Cog's Cares initi initiatives, we held a holiday card making event for older adults at uh, Senior Support Services, which is an organization which serves older adults who are experiencing, experiencing homelessness. Um, so senior support services, they, they, they hold a holiday breakfast um, where they provide gift bags with essentials like sweaters, gloves, underwear, et cetera, stuff like that. And our ha handwritten cards will be attached to those gift, gift bags um, when, they're when they're distributed. So it's a pretty cool deal. We made 240 cards in total. Um, some staff had trouble uh, coloring inside the lines, but other than that, I think most of the cars look pretty good. I would say 230 of the 240 look pretty darn good. So, uh, so thank, thank staff for that. Um, the, other, uh, the other initiative I want to make sure you guys are aware of is, um, and certainly those who have been on the board for quite some time, you've heard us talk about this, is um, we, every year we adopt um, the Sparely House or the Sparely Center uh, during the holidays, and this is this um, it's a living facility which it's some quite frankly some of the poorest members of our of, of our of our community. Um, so we receive wish lists from them with two items on that, and um, so staff purchases those items. And this year we. Um, when everything was said and done, each resident received their, those gifts, as well as uh, we had about $400 uh, in, in, uh, that were donated by staff as well, which will be used for activity supplies to, to be enjoyed by all at the Sparely Center. So we're really proud of this, in, uh, this, this initiative, and I uh, want to thank staff again for their participation. Last but not least, and Bob, Bob said this earlier, but be, on, on behalf of Dr. Cog's staff, I want to wish you all a very warm and safe holiday season. And thank you all very, very much for the continued service of making life better for the residents of this wonderful community. So thank you. Thank you.
All right, moving right along, public comment. Up to 45 minutes is allocated now for public comment, and each speaker will be limited to three minutes. If there are any additional requests from the public to address the board, time will be allocated at the end of the meeting to complete public comment. I request that there be no public comment on issues for which a prior public hearing has been held before this board. Consent and action items will begin immediately after the last speaker. Is there anyone here to speak of a public comment? Seeing none, we'll move right along to item number nine in agenda. This is our consent agenda. Uh, I'm looking for a motion to approve the consent agenda. I have a second. Se second. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Intentions? That carries. Thank you very much. Moving on to item number 10, action items. Discussion on staff recommended approval for proposed actions regarding the fiscal year 2019 project delays. It's attachment E in your packet. Mr. Cottrell. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, by the way, thing, uh, nice sweater. Thank you. So just thought I'd be the first Star Wars, so. It's awesome. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> but we're not as dark as Aaron, though. Okay. <laughs> 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 okay, there you go. Uh, so the adopted tip policy outlines the expectations set forth for project phase initiation and how to address delays if they do take place. Um, these delays, and regardless of the reasons for these delays, do tie up the limited amount of funds that Dr. Cog has to allocate towards projects. Um, so each year at the end of every fiscal year, so this for this example, at the end of uh, federal fiscal year 19, a couple months ago in October, um, Dr. Cog's staff requested CDOT and RTD to review the status of project phases with FY19 funding, in addition to those that were delayed for a first year last year. So after confirmation from both our planning, aid, our planning partners, um, staff contacted the sponsors with the project phases that were not initiated and not initiated and therefore delayed um, to find out the reasons for the delay and then also to assist them in developing an action plan to get that project um, initiated so that it would no longer become delayed. The attached report uh, summarizes these project phases that were delayed as of September 30th and this last or this year. So the report outlines that two project phases were delayed for a second year. Um, if you recall, this last October, each before uh, each appeared before this board to seek a variance in the TIP policy to continue. Each were granted a 120-day extension, meaning that they would have to hit their initiation. For these two projects, they were to uh, initiate construction by the end of January um, of 2020. So in addition to these two projects, there's also 13 projects that are first year delayed. Uh, one project by the city and county of Broomfield has already met their um, status and is therefore no longer delayed. And the action to approve these, the, the proposed motion that is in your memo this evening would allow these projects to continue. Uh, so with that, happy to take any comments or questions that you may have. Any questions? Questions on the second year delays? So we're gonna meet the dates? <coughs> Member says yes in Lakewood. Lakewood? Okay. <laughs> it always reminds me of somebody saying, trust me. <laughs> um, as some of you know, I'm a stickler about the second year delay because it's a lot of money and other communities have shelf ready projects. And the only question I would have, if there's any questions from the board with Denver, is you're having a neighborhood association now having an objection to your project this late and some project that's been out for some time. Is there some thoughts on how that, that might have happened? I'll let Justin Begley from our project team answer that. Okay, thank you. Justin Begley, uh, City County Denver. Um, so the Broadway project, as it approached um, completing its environmental uh, analysis. The way the original um, agreement was set up was with the neighborhood where a part of the project is being listed as a consulting party. So they have a lot of say in how their streets um, and the project is delivered in their neighborhood. And um, there was some concern about a proposed, um, basically we're, we're talking about the cross section on Exposition Avenue 
and it's uh, the plan is to widen it to 66 feet, and the neighborhood wanted it a couple less feet, and so that's been taking a, a lot longer to get their concerns addressed. Okay, and, and you all think you'll hit it by the end of January? We are. Okay. All righty. That's the only question I had. Uh, yes, Mr. X. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, real quick. I just wanted to, um, uh, just a clarification on what exactly this is. So this is, this is delays from the old tip. It's not the new tip. If you recall, we had a, a new delay policy in the new tip, right, Todd? And it's actually a, a little more aggressive than even this is. But that yes. doesn't come into effect till next year. I just want to make everybody aware of that. Yes. Lakewood. I didn't catch your name. Jacob Labeer. Um, yeah, I could just speak a little bit to Lakewood. Some of our delay was related to um, some land swap arrangements with RTD. We got that into first reading, so we're on track to have that happen in January. So, you said RTD, and I got it from there. <laughs> <laughs> and she, oh, Bill, he doesn't say anything down there. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you for answering my questions. Uh, looking for a motion to approve the delays. So moved to be approved the delays without delay. <laughs> do, I, do, I, do I have a second? I can't. Those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? All right. Motion carries. Thank you very much. Moving on to item number 11, a discussion on Dr. Cogs becoming the direct recipient for Federal Transit Administration, Section 5310, Enhanced Mobility of Seniors and Individuals with Disabilities Program Funding. It's attachment F in your, in your um, packet. Uh, Mr. Helfand, are you doing this? Good evening. Matthew Helfand, Senior Transportation Planner here. Oh, you're, you, you like it's my color. sweater. <laughs> no, no, this is um, Florida State. Oh, I went to grad ball. school there. Gross. This is not a bulldog. <laughs> I, I also went to grad school at University of Florida. <laughs> That's probably gross too. Are they allowed uh, to wear other state shirts or <laughs> no, no rule against that? <laughs> so, good That's evening. A tough crowd tonight. Happy holidays. Very tough crowd. Bill Calvert gets up there. <laughs> He's it. Yeah. Yep. We got some comments for him. <laughs> So uh, just a little bit of background. Uh, the FTA uh, Section 5310 program, uh, otherwise known as uh, Enhanced Mobility of Seniors and Individuals with Disabilities, is a um, formula funding program to improve mobility for older adults and individuals with disabilities. And in the Denver Aurora urbanized area, and I'll show you a map in a few slides, uh, the, the annual appropriation is just under two million and it grows a little bit every year. So uh, th these are several project types that are eligible. Uh, the most common project types that are awarded are mobility management, uh, rolling stock vehicles, and uh, um, operating assistance. And so here's the map. Uh, the Denver Aurora urbanized area is in yellow, and as you can see, it's not the entire Dr. Cog region. Uh, the areas um, outside of the, uh, the Denver Aurora urbanized area are either areas outside of, of the urbanized area or otherwise known as rural areas, and there are three small urbanized areas in the northwestern portion of the county, all located in uh, Boulder County. And so this was the primary recommendation of a Dr. Max study, the Denver Regional Mobility and Access Council, as a be best practice to integrate and leverage multiple funding sources to best serve the transportation needs for vulnerable populations. Uh, so we are going to, or we anticipate uh, uh, coordinating three different funding sources. Two of them we already have. Uh, first of all, uh, the Older Americans Act funding that comes through our Area Agency on Aging, as well as the human service uh, transportation set aside from our TIP that you approved last year. Uh, we have a, uh, had a call for projects. It was actually a joint call for projects with CDOT, and um, CDOT had the um, 
the, the, the next year of 5310 funding for the Denver Aurora urbanized area, and we had the human service transportation set aside funding, and we put them together. And um, because the, um, the, the human service transportation set aside was swapped with state dollars, uh, respondents, uh, applicants were able to uh, request uh, match funding from the human service transportation set aside so that we can um, increase the amount of funding that uh, can go toward transportation and reduce uh, match requirements from the applicants. And because of that, we're able to um, uh, grant out awards in the 5310 program for the Denver Aurora urbanized area uh, fully this time. It's, it's been traditionally under, under um, subscribed uh, in the Denver Aurora urbanized area due to um, a lack of, uh, of affordability of, uh, upon the, the applicants uh, to, to cover the match. And so it's a win-win. We get more transportation projects, which means more mobility for vulnerable populations throughout the Denver region. Well, I, I should, well, so the, the human service transportation set aside is uh, for the entire MPO boundaries. So essentially throughout the Denver region. Uh, Finally, I'd like to just say that uh, we've been working for well over a year now uh, with our planning partners and stakeholders uh, to make sure that we have all of our I's dotted, T's crossed, and that everyone's comfortable. We've been working with FTA and RTD and CDOT, who is the current, uh, the, the, the current designated recipient for this. And so we are ready to take on this new challenge and um, the next step, if, if the board approves uh, this evening, is to send a letter uh, to the governor, uh, and that letter is in your packet. And I'd be happy to take any questions that you may have. Any questions? Yes, uh, Director Partridge. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, we've actually, in Douglas County, have been very pleased with this program through the years actually has it has been administered through CDOT. So we are somewhat resistant to begin with, but I want to commend Executive Director Rex and Jayla for coming down and going through this. And, and I know in Boulder County had some concerns with this too, uh, to see that this, as we understand it, will go through fully t the AAA and will not be subject to TIP or Metrovision, as I understand. Just want to verify that. That's correct. That's correct. Thank you. Any other questions? Seeing none, I'll look for a motion. Do I have a second? All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstentions? The motion carries. Thank you very much. Next up, we have uh, item number 12, a discussion on federally required performance-based planning safety targets, attachment G in your packet. Mr. Rieger. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Jacob Rieger, Long Range Transportation Planning Manager with Dr. Cog. Let me pull up the presentation. Okay, thank you very much. So this topic is something that you see uh, once a year. Um, every year this is a federal process involving um, transportation performance management regarding uh, safety targets. <clears throat> and as I get into this presentation, uh, we're, in, we're in a very festive mood tonight, but I do wanna be clear on this particular topic. Um, you know, we're gonna talk about it and I'm gonna say that we've achieved some targets, but I wanna be really clear that when we talk about safety, the only acceptable number that I hope to eventually show on these slides is the number zero, and we're not there yet. So I wanna be really clear that um, in some ways we are making progress, and I'm gonna talk about regional vision zero and so on, but um, one death is one too many, and so I wanna say that as we, as we get into this. Um, that said, safety is one of the several uh, topics of which uh, FHWA requires uh, MPOs and organizations like ours around the country uh, to do performance-based planning. Uh, we set targets in several areas, and then we measure our progress towards achieving those targets. So this slide shows the various topics in which we need to, uh, we need to measure ourselves. Most of, the, most of the topics that you see on the screen are targets that we do every two years or four years. Safety is the one set of targets that we do every single year. 
Uh, specifically around safety, uh, we're responsible for setting targets and measuring progress in five specific areas. Um, the number of fatalities, um, fatalities per million vehicle miles traveled, so think of that as fatality rate, serious injuries, serious injury rate, and then a combination of um, uh, non-motorized uh, fatalities and serious injuries combined into one measure. Uh, I want to be clear also as we talk about this that this is this is a federal process. It's important. I don't want to diminish it, but it's a very near term, very short term, very pragmatic um, sort of requirements that we have. The, these these uh, measures and targets are prescribed. Uh, the methodology is somewhat prescribed. The time frame is prescribed. So yes, we need to do this, and, and it's important. Um, our work really stems from MetroVision and our current target in MetroVision of less than 100 fatalities by 2040. And I'll talk about how we integrate that in this methodology in just a moment. And then as you all know, we're undertaking a regional Vision Zero plan. And one of the big sort of policy conversations we're gonna have next year as we move to adopt that plan is to talk about how do we integrate that target of zero into our other work. So I guess I wanna be clear that this is a short-term exercise and we're doing things that are a longer-term exercise. Um, another map for you, um, in this case, um, the area that's kind of in the reddish here on the map, kind of our MPO um, uh, boundary in red, this is the area in which we're talking about these targets and the numbers that I show you. The area is outside the red, so the green, uh, Gilpin and Clear Creek County and Eastern Adams and Arapahoe counties, those areas um, CDOT has responsibility for and they go through a similar uh, exercise. So we're talking about the areas in red tonight. You will also notice in red in the northern part of our region, Southwest Weld County, uh, which is part of our MPO and it's part of the Dr. Cog planning area. Uh, keep that in mind as that's gonna become important in a couple slides. So let's start off with uh, the first you know, sort of measure of these. There's a lot of numbers on here. We're gonna do a little bit of math, but I'm gonna try and make this as painless as possible. The point of this slide is our methodology. As I've said, we anchor this work in MetroVision. Again, our MetroVision target of 2040, less than 100 fatalities uh, annually by 2040. So when we talked about setting these short-term targets, we anchored it in the policy framework of MetroVision and we said, what would it take based on when we started this two years ago so that's what on the right is showing. Don't pay attention so much to the numbers. The point is that we had a baseline you know, back in 2016, 2017. What would it take um, to reach that MetroVision to target by 2040? And what, you know, what rate would that mean on an annual basis? And that's the methodology that we're using uh, to set our fatality targets. And that's what we've done. This will now be the third year uh, that we've brought this target to you. And we've consistently used that methodology. So this slide is, is showing on fatalities, basically, and there's a lot of numbers on this slide. The point of this slide is that when we look at overall fatalities, uh, we have achieved the target. <clears throat> And again, let me just be clear in saying that, I don't take any pride in saying that only this many people suffered a fatality. The correct number here is zero. We are working to get there in regional vision zero. We're not there yet. But in terms of this very short-term federal exercise, um, we have been meeting our fatality target. The other point I should make about all these targets is that it's a little complicated, but based on the federal methodology, it's based on a rolling five-year average. So for example, in a few minutes, I'm gonna ask you for a motion on setting our 2020 target. Targets. Those 2020 targets are comprised of the years 2016 through 2020. It's those five years. Well, if you think about that, what's our ability to affect change, right? Um, 2016 through 2018 are already done. Nothing we can do about it. 2019 is about 12 days from being done. Almost nothing we can do about it. So it's really the year 2020 itself um, that, we're, that we're focusing on. So my point is not to be negative or, or depressing. My point is simply to emphasize that in these targets on a rolling five-year average, they're very, very short time frame in terms of our ability to affect change. And that's why we're concentrating so hard on our MetroVision work and our regional Vision Zero work. Um, when we talk about uh, serious injuries, we didn't have a MetroVision, we didn't have MetroVision guidance about what to do with serious injuries. So we came up with the methodology of literally holding the line. Could we hold the line on serious injuries, particularly as our population continues to increase? So we said that at least, you know, every year we want to at least decrease by one, right? Literally hold the line on serious injuries as we go forward into this work. So again, a lot of numbers on this slide, but the point here is that we have been meeting our uh, serious injuries, um, uh, serious injury targets. Uh, let's see. 
The other point I want to make on the serious injuries, remember I talked about Southwest Weld County. We did discover this year that we received the wrong data for serious injuries. Um, we were inadvertently including all of Weld County in our calculations of the targets. So yes, we met our targets because we had more, more in there than we should have. Um, so we've corrected that this year. And part of what we're proposing for the 2020 target um, is actually to re-anchor in what the number should have been and then continue on that same path of holding the line. Um, so yes, we've been meeting this target, but we're adjusting um, our 2020 target and going forward to account for the fact that we're really only responsible for Southwest Weld County. <clears throat> and this just kind of shows uh, where we're at on, um, did I go backwards? Okay, so here we go. So this shows uh, where we're at on uh, serious injuries. Again, uh, we're meeting the targets that we've set so far uh, on serious injuries. Okay, and actually this, this shows some of the numbers behind that. Okay, let's talk about the last one. So that was serious injuries and serious injury rate. Uh, let's talk about the last measure, which is non-motorized. Um, this is a combination, again, of fatalities and uh, serious injuries. It's a uh, per federal, federal requirements, a combined measure of both of those together. So this one is actually a compilation of both methodologies. On the fatality side of it, we're using that MetroVision approach, again, using that same sort of what would it take um, to, um, to get there by 2040. So that's for the fatality piece of it. And then on serious injuries, again, we're using hold the line. We put those numbers together to come up with a combined target uh, for non-motorized uh, non uh, fatalities and serious injuries. So here, I do have a little bit of, of bad news beyond the bad news of none of these numbers being zero. We are meeting our fatality. We're, we're achieving our fatality targets for non-motorized fatalities. We have not been achieving our targets for uh, non-motorized serious injuries. However, that said, in our proposed for our 2020 target, we still want to stick to this methodology. We don't want to give ground on what we're trying to do here. And I will say that in Regional Vision Zero, in particular, we are focusing on these vulnerable populations because we know that bicyclists and pedestrians are overrepresented in serious injuries and fatalities. We also know, and this isn't really good news, but we think we, we, think we might know that as we hopefully become more successful in reducing fatalities, some of those fatalities will convert to serious injury. So it, it's a little counterintuitive, but sometimes when fatalities go down, serious injuries can go up a little bit. So having said all that, this table shows um, the 2018 targets, 2019 targets, and our proposed 2020 targets. Again, based on the methodologies that I've outlined here this evening, the numbers are consistent. A question you might have is on a couple of these, why are the 2020 targets higher than in previous years? The answer is because, again, think of the fact that per federal requirements, this is based on a rolling five-year average, particularly when we started in 2016, we had some high numbers. So as that rolls through the five-year average, we're, we're sort of accounting for that high number. We believe that this 2020 will be the last year in which we have that phenomenon. So it will be more of a straight line reduction down to 2040. But you do see on a couple of these numbers, because we have those sort of in the middle, those higher numbers, those do act to inflate the rolling five-year average. But having said that, the methodology has been consistent all three years in how we're setting these targets. So with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions. And again, looking for a motion to approve those 2020 safety targets. Director Atchison. Just in, I know that uh, Denver has been working really hard on Vision Zero. I don't know if Nick, haven't either one have got any idea. Last numbers I heard were your numbers were going up, not down. And with the emphasis that you've put on it so wide in the Denver, what's not happening? Because this, this has a direct effect on what we're trying to do here that uh, we're talking about. It, if I could address that first, just from a uh, from my own district in Southwest Denver, when I had the report, I think in August, when we were already in, ex in exceedance of the year prior, I asked for a report on the three fatalities that occurred in my district. And for the life of me, I don't know what any program could do to have changed them. One of them was a, a guy on a rocket motorcycle who just decided to speed himself into a fixed object. Uh, a light pole in my neighborhood, actually. Uh, another one was an elderly woman who parked her car in her driveway but didn't set the brake, and she was run over by her car in her driveway. 
And the third one was a driver speeding on Wadsworth who went under a semi that was making a left turn. And, and I don't, again, I don't know anything that we could have done as a city other than more education, maybe more enforcement, that might have prevented the first and the third. Uh, but for the life of me, I'm, I'm at a loss as to what else that we could roll out that would have prevented them. I think there's a difference between crash and accidents, right? I mean, that's what you're finding there. The second one was an accident. True. The other two are crashes. She, she just didn't set yeah. the brake, right? Um, Director Olson. Oh, sorry. Director Williams, do you want to... Sure, that. sure. I'll just add. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, I mean, it's a it's a multitude of factors. A huge one is just the uh, huge increase in population that all of our communities have seen over the past ten years. Um, but but I mean, you nailed it. Where it's our literally our top focus at our department right now. We have meetings every morning at eight a.m. to review. There are a lot of different things you've seen. We've reduced speed limits. We're really focusing on a, a safe multimodal network, and then just things as simple as. Um, making sure we're striping and restriping crosswalks and making things as safe as we can on that. But it's a lot of factors, a lot of different things. Um, and yeah, it's going to continue to be our focus. Mr. Olson? Linda? All right. Anybody else have a question? Comments? Um, I just have a question about this vision zero. I mean, there's some communities like Denver and others that have adopted some form of it. Or, um, I guess the question is more of the take rate. Like, how many people are signing up to really uh, achieve a regional goal? Because I, I wonder if it's a small number that have signed up. I can tell you, my community hasn't, and there's this whole discussion around how do you achieve it on goal. But I think in sense of what the unnecessarily hitting zero. I think that. It, but it's the intent of trying to hit zero. So how many how many people or questions people communities have have joined in on this? Yeah. So thank you, Mr. Chair. So so far in the region, there are uh, three jurisdictions that have done actual sort of branded Vision Zero uh, plans are very close to Vision Zero. Denver, Boulder, and Brighton. Um, Lakewood has a very robust safety program that they don't call Vision Zero, but for all intents and purposes, it's, it's getting towards the same, you know, very focused on, on safety in Lakewood. And there's other communities doing a lot of things. I want to be clear about that. In our work so far in Regional Vision Zero, and we're still putting the plan together, we have not yet asked anyone to quote unquote sort of sign up to that. What our intent is, Mr. Chair, with this plan is that we want this to be a tool and a resource to the entire region. We anticipate some communities may want to take the plan and adopt it. They would be encouraged to do so. Some communities may want to take the data in the plan you know, customize it for themselves and sort of create their own plan, whether they call it Vision Zero or not. That's another choice. Other communities just, you know, may want to take that data and just kind of help them do more on safety than, than what they're doing today. And that's really the goal. Um, once the plan is completed and adopted, it's our strong uh, vision here at Dr. Cog that regional Vision Zero, it's not just a plan, Denver can speak to this as well, it's not just a plan you adopt. This is going to be an ongoing program of Dr. Cog where we provide, you know, resources, education, data, encouragement, information, anything and everything we can do to help our communities, you know, carry this work forward, whether it's branded as Vision Zero or not, uh, the point is to bring resources to, uh, to this subject so that we can help everyone do more than we've been able to do so far. I guess the, the concern I have is, you know, I don't know how much effort each of our communities is doing to, this. I mean, these numbers are region-wide, and I'm sure we're doing some sort of it, but is there any collective view? Director Solzman? Um, thank you. I wasn't I wasn't raising my hand to answer your direct question. Oh, you're I think it's a valiant question. Um, I'm not sure I have an answer for you, but I was going to propose a motion to propose um, move to approve the proposed 2020 safety targets for the Dr. Cog Transportation Management Area as required by the FAST Act. Any further discussion? Okay. All second. In, oh, do I have a second? Second. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? That carries. Okay, next up, we have informational briefings. Uh, item number 13, proposed 2050 MetroVision Regional Transportation Plan, proposed scenarios to test, attachment H in your packet. Uh, Mr. Rieger. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So sorry, I'll have to look at this sweater for two presentations in a row, but here we are. <laughs> um, so I'd say the, the, past, the last presentation was talking about sort of the near term. Now we're going to switch gears and talk about the long term. We're going to talk about 2050. 
Um, many of you have seen a version of this presentation already, some of you have not. So I wanna get us all kind of on the same page of what we're proposing as part of our 2050 MetroVision Regional Transportation Plan for scenario analysis work that we'll be undertaking uh, early in 2020. So first of all, just a reminder um, of our 2050 planning process that I presented to you at your last meeting. Um, I think you've seen this graphic before that lays out our overall timeline and schedule. We're completing phase one, which has been sort of the public and stakeholder outreach, you know, hearing from folks, what's important to you, what do you care about, what are your priorities. We're now entering phase two, which is where we start taking that information and start doing some planning work and start thinking about what does that say about choices, priorities, trade-offs as we start the plan development process and then as we get into the middle of 2020 um, and towards the end of next year actually putting the 2050 plan together um, specifically around scenario planning this is just sort of a simplified flow chart of what we anticipate that process looking like um, again we've been we have been focused on our phase one engagement we'll be doing engagement as part of every phase and I want to be clear about that um, we've been preparing our tools. Uh, most of you know that we have a very robust activity-based uh, multimodal uh, travel model. Uh, we have a uh, cloud-based uh, land use model, Urban Sim. Um, our land use team has been working with your jurisdictions to prepare uh, the 2050 base land use forecasts. So we've been getting our tools together to do this work. Uh, so we're in the blue box, the third box, where we are in the process of uh, defining and we'll soon be testing some scenarios, and that's what I'll talk about tonight. <laughs> and then again, as it feeds into uh, plan development next year. So just a little bit about scenarios. Um, I think many of you have heard the term scenario planning. Um, I'm sure some of your jurisdictions have actually engaged in a scenario uh, planning process. Scenario planning is really all about looking at the future and it's kind of bracketing what are the sort of wild and crazy things that could happen in the future. You wanna test yourself a little bit on you know some pretty bold things, not because those things as you originally envisioned them might come true, but in the sense of looking at those things when you look out as far as you can and test yourself as far as you can, then you can sort of back into what's a little bit more realistic. So we're really looking at what if alternative futures. Uh, we'll be testing alternative transportation urban form approaches through the lens of Metro Vision. Uh, relative comparisons between these scenarios, and I'll show you the scenarios in just a moment. Um, and again, I want to be clear, you know, this is not about picking a scenario or a hybrid scenario. This is not about good or bad. This is simply about very different, purposely distinct versions of the future so that you can test different relationships between urban form, land use, and mobility. You know, what happens if we do this? Or, you know, we have this crazy idea. What if we did this thing? What would result? That's kind of what scenario planning is all about. It's a sketch sketch planning exercise. And the point here is providing guidance and direction eventually for putting the plan together. This is not about, so some of the feedback that I've gotten as I've uh, made this presentation, to be clear, this is not about uh, testing individual projects. So you're gonna see some components of scenarios in just a moment. This is not about like, hey, here's a project, go out and do this tomorrow. This is again, testing concepts. So here is a table that shows all the scenarios. I'm gonna leave this up for a few seconds. I'm gonna hide it and give you a quiz on it. See what you remember in the next five seconds. All right, so I'm gonna go through each of these really briefly. Um, the couple points that I'd make on this table are two things. One is that we're also comparing to a baseline and we're, what we're proposing to use as the baseline is our current adopted 2040 MetroVision Regional Transportation Plan. That is our current long range transportation plan. That is one version of the future. It has projects in it, it has land use uh, uh, data, it has financial plan assumptions, you know, it has all the other elements of a plan. That's one version of the future we're gonna compare it against these very different uh, versions of the future. The other point I'll make about this table as I start explaining the scenarios is simply that, again, we're looking at the full spectrum of multimodal transportation, and you're gonna see that in a moment when I talk about a transit scenario and a highway scenario and a technology scenario. Again, it's not that any of these individual scenarios are the best scenario or maybe the one that you might like the most or the least. It's that we're trying to get the full spectrum of multimodal transportation so that we really can test some of these ideas and test some of these relationships. 
based on the results, so here's another thing that I've heard based on um, previous versions of this presentation, you know, based on the um, initial results of this scenario work and based on the time and schedule, we actually hope to be able to put some of these together. So in each scenario, we're gonna test the components as a package, but we wanna understand in each scenario, what what is it or what are the combination of things moving the needle? And then can we put a couple of these together and actually test them together and see, well, do these two things work together? So let me kind of quickly walk you through each of these scenarios. So here's a transit scenario. Again, the idea here is what if we really emphasize public transportation and put, put some eggs in the transit basket uh, through doing some of these following things. Uh, looking at, you know, RTD is, is completing their bus rapid transit study. So looking at their corridors that they identified for federal or state uh, candidates for funding, uh, finishing fast tracks, uh, free fares, kind of testing that concept. We've heard a lot about that. Well, what if you made transit free? Well, what would happen? Let's test that, right? Um, increased transit frequency um, and improving access to transit. So these package of things we would test in a transit scenario and we would try to understand which of these or a combination of these things might move the needle from a transit side. In contrast, here's a highway and operations scenario. So what if we looked at a scenario that really concentrated on operations and traffic flow on the region's major highways and freeways? So um, HPTE, the High Performance Transportation Enterprise, has been working on Express Lanes Master Plan. They've mapped out a network of express lanes uh, in the metro region and direct connections um, between those. So what if we modeled that um, as a strategy? And what if we modeled or simulated things like roadway operations and incident management strategies, really focus on traffic flow on our major highways? You know, what would that do? That's what this scenario is about. Uh, somewhat related, but a little bit different scenario. What if we looked at a congestion emphasis scenario? The idea here is, you know, we've often heard like, well, what if we just focus on those bottlenecks and those, you know, hotspot freeway locations? And what if we try to eliminate congestion on those locations? I think we all know we probably can't completely eliminate congestion in peak period rush hour, but what if we strategically try to um, look at some investments that might try to do that in off-peak periods? Again, just as a contrast scenario, what would it take to do that? So adding general purpose lanes to the region's freeways and interstates um, in those locations with severe off-peak congestion. Again, this isn't something that, that CDOT or anyone else has the funding to go out to do tomorrow, but as a concept, let's test it. Let's see what happens. Uh, a couple more scenarios, we've heard a lot about technology, connected vehicles, autonomous vehicles. Uh, well, what if we tried to test something around technology? There's two schools of thought on sort of the future of technology and mobility around connected and autonomous vehicles. So one school of thought that we would test is that, you know, hey, because of technology, we can platoon these vehicles together. We can space them, you know, three feet apart or five feet apart or whatever that is. And we can, we can increase capacity on, you know, lanes or on facilities where these uh, connected or autonomous vehicles would, would travel. All right, so what if we tested that? What would happen if we simulated that effect? The other side of the coin, what if because of safety standards, you know, very strict safety standards for connected and autonomous vehicles, they were actually spaced further apart? We all learned this in driver's ed is the two second rule, uh, which most of us actually don't follow. What if we actually had proper spacing of vehicles and what if doing so actually decreased capacity a little bit? You know, what would happen there? So we wanna test both sides of that coin. Uh, two more scenarios, so uh, travel choices emphasis scenario. This is really about multimodal urban arterials. As much as we travel on freeways, we also travel quite a bit on our region's urban arterials. What if we had a strategy that talked about increasing mobility on those urban arterials? by doing things like increasing walking and bicycling attractiveness, sort of a complete streets approach on some of these arterials, um, telecommuting and other transportation demand management strategies, increasing access to the base transit network, you know, making that more attractive. And then we just had a somber conversation about safety. What if we looked at reducing speed limits a little bit on some of these arterials as a safety emphasis? We know that there's a direct correlation, even causation between speed and, and crashes. So again, not reducing speed to sort of make travel harder, but to make the combination of these, of these ideas to make these arterials more attractive for multimodal travel and multimodal mobility. So that's this scenario. And then the final scenario, uh, regional jobs, housing balance. We know that there are many locations in the region where there's a real inflow of workers, people who live far away, travel long distances for work. 
So what if on a regional scale, not in an individual community, but at the regional scale, we looked at trying to bring what we call some of those origins and destinations just a little bit closer together? What would happen on a region-wide basis if we tried to simulate that strategy in terms of like trip lengths and vehicle miles of travel and vehicle hours of travel and other sort of regional travel characteristics? So that's what this scenario is about. So I think I have one more slide and then I wanna go back to the table just to give you a sense of process. We've been in this input gathering mode for the past three months, um, hearing from the public and the results that I presented from our initial engagement at the last board meeting. Um, our transportation advisory committee, uh, regional transportation committee looked at this. I've been out to several of your county forums to get your input, uh, which I really appreciate. So we've been putting all this together to help shape some of these ideas and form these scenarios. Um, if we get your endorsement tonight, uh, we anticipate starting this work right after New Year's, spending the first quarter of 2020 actually getting into this work and testing these ideas, and then aiming, um, so this says RTC on here, but uh, same with the board, aiming to bring some results to our Transportation Advisory Committee in March and to all of you in April. So that's our near-term next steps on this. So having said that, let me come back to the table so you can see them all together again, um, and I'd invite any questions you might have. Thank you. Questions for Mr. Rieger? Yes, Director. I'm sorry I wasn't at the, thank you, Chair. I'm sorry I wasn't at the last meeting, but I, in the minutes I see a comment there um, about convincing um, companies to promote teleworking, and I wondered if that would be included in that scenario. Um, yes, it would actually be included in the, um, uh, in the travel choices emphasis, emphasis scenario. Um, again, either modeling or simulating, you know, that and other transportation demand management strategies as part of that urban arterials approach. Any other questions? Yes, Director Brockett. Thanks very much for that. Um, I look forward to seeing some of these results. And it seems like some, some of them would pair together very naturally, yes. and some of them are mutually exclusive. So are you going to bring forward sets of two or three as well as the individual ones? So yes, Director, that's our anticipation that based on the results of the initial work and, and our time and schedule, we do want to try and put some of these together that seem to have a natural fit and see what happens when we start combining some of these strategies. Thank you. Director Teal. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, uh, Jacob, I mean, uh, part of what came out of our discussions in Castle Rock is um, Obviously, we see uh, how you're fitting, fitting in the land use uh, components in here. But one of the things that we um, really would, would like to ask, or and, and correct if we can, that be a part of this modeling, is uh, using realistic land use, that reflecting what is planned like right now. And I say that, and I, I want to use two examples for that. This is our horizon for build out in Castle Rock, 2050. Uh, timeline and so we have land use that's planned at this time that looks a lot like a field full of cows right now okay. how that land use uh, of course is modeled could have great effect in our area and we suspect in other uh, areas of the region kind of on that urban rural boundary like we are secondly uh, the other thing to point out is we're still kind of haunted in Castle Rock with the gap experience on South I-25, where there did not seem to be the appropriate levels of planning over the course of the last 50 years since that was, road was built. And then, of course, in the last five years, we found ourselves in a situation where 24% of all jobs in the state of Colorado are between Arapahoe County, Douglas County, and El Paso County. So. Part of that would be also maybe defining the extraterritorial land uses and how that could affect. I think we hear from the state demographer that Colorado Springs is meant to be the largest municipality and metro area in Colorado over the course of the next 20 years. That would have an effect for us, but I would suspect those of the communities on the northern end of the region would have something similar with northern Colorado. And, uh, and perhaps even uh, the western uh, side of the region. So getting that extraterritorial land use as a, 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 as a component of the land use components would be very important for us mm -hmm. to have confidence in the modeling scenarios. 
Yeah, thank you, Director Teal. And I remember your comments from the Douglas County Forum and we've held on to them and appreciate them. You covered a lot of ground, but just really briefly, let me address a couple of the things you said. So in the 2050 sort of base land use forecast, that's part of where we're trying to bring sort of that realism, you know, what's being planned in the local communities, uh, what does Dole and the state demographer say about where the growth is and trying to balance some of that. So we are very cognizant of that. Some of these scenarios do anticipate making some changes in land use really just to support the concept of the scenario. So for example, if we're looking at transit, if we're looking at urban arterials, obviously, especially the regional jobs housing balance, making some appropriate land use adjustments to fit sort of the philosophy of that scenario, but cognizant of, again, starting from that 2050 base. Um, in terms of sort of external trips and, and traffic from outside the region, that is something that we account for in our model and we actually coordinate uh, with our neighbors both to the north and south um, so that we're, uh, we're consistent in our projections from the future of what traffic is coming in. Um, so we try and account for those effects in our traffic model to be cognizant of those trips coming in from outside the region. Okay, thank you, Jake. Appreciate that. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Oh, sorry, uh, Director Jones. Thanks. Oh, sorry. Um, I had a, a question, and maybe you already said this, and I zoned out. What are the metrics you're using to measure and compare the different scenarios? Is it going to be similar to the last time, where everything from, you know, tax dollars to water consumption, or is it the Metro Vision goals specifically, or some mix thereof? Um, so I didn't say it, so thanks for calling me out on that. Um, <laughs> I promised our Transportation Advisory Committee that we'd start that conversation with them early next year, so I don't want to presuppose exactly uh, what they might say, but I'll tell you in concept a few things that we're thinking about, and you alluded to some of them, in terms of how, how do you evaluate this stuff? How do you compare these scenarios? So one obvious way that we know we're going to do in some way, shape, or form is some of those outcomes and some of those targets in MetroVision. Uh, when you all adopted or when the board adopted MetroVision, unanimously back in 2017, you were pretty clear about some of the things that, you know, we want to sort of measure our progress and see in this region by 2040. So that's one place to start, but that's not the only way that we're going to do this. Um, there are a lot of quantitative uh, measurements that we can use, and we do anticipate using many of those outputs from our model. You know, I alluded to some of them like VMT and measures like that. But we also recognize that part of this is storytelling, that there's, there's qualitative aspects to this as well. I mean, these are versions of the future, right? And that's not just numbers coming out of a model. So let me give you one example that we talked about at one of the forums at least is what about human service transportation? You know, Matthew just presented on the FTA 5310 program, right? So that's not something we can model in a traffic model, but we know generally sort of what the region is spending on human service transportation. We kind of know what we're getting for that in terms of, of, you know, clients and ridership and so on, you know, particularly in the transit scenario and maybe a couple other scenarios, we can sort of simulate, well, if we double that or triple that, you know, what sort of benefit or what implications? would we have from that? So I think there are several factors like that um, that we can bring in as part of the evaluation of these scenarios. Does that answer your question, Director Jones? It does. Thank you very much. Um, then just might I put in a plug, having spent the last two days at the Air Quality Control Commission working on rulemakings, um, that air quality and climate emissions be a part of the metrics since that is a pretty big issue facing our region and state and planet. They will be. It's part of Metro Vision. It's part of our regional transportation plan. We will do that. All right, uh, Director uh, Binkley and then Director Maurer. Hi. Um, so I've been watching this journey the past couple of meetings, and I loved how you've been out like talking to the people. My question is, how are you going to continue that transparency throughout this entire process? Like, are people going to be able to see everyone what's happening with this? Yes. Um, short answer, yes. Um, you know, so we're going to we're going to be very public and transparent in terms of our results and what they're telling us, right? Because this is a learning opportunity. It's a learning opportunity for us as staff and for all of you in our communities. You know, what resonates here? You know, we're testing some of these strategies. Do they work? Or do they not work? I mean, that's part of what we want to learn. Um, you saw the schedule, in fact, maybe I can go to it again really quick. 
uh, through our entire, this one, through our entire planning process, you know, we've broken into four phases. This is a very simplified schedule, but um, every single phase, we're going to have um, a level of outreach, whether that's, you know, public meetings, uh, coming to the county forums. In the first phase, we did an online survey, you know, so we're gonna do techniques like that throughout the entirety of the plan process, geared specifically towards the activities we're undertaking at the time. In particular, with the public in this scenario planning exercise, this really is all about uh, choices and trade-offs. We're going to find, I already know, we're going to find in these scenarios that some scenarios will do some things really well, and other scenarios will do other things really well. well. What does the public think about that? What's more important to them? So we do absolutely anticipate that level of engagement throughout this entire process. Director Maurer? Presentation. Um, I was just curious when I'm looking at the travel choice emphasis. Um, I just think in the future we're going to be using several types of transportation. Um, be able to build that into you know, analysis. If you're going from you know your car to a bus, <coughs> and sometimes a bus to a train, you know, in those things, because I think some of that's going to be. I wonder if you'll be able to. Yeah, some of those things we can model directly or at least sort of implicitly understand um, based on other outputs of the model, particularly in the travel choice scenario. I mean, that's kind of the point of, you know, whatever modes you want to take, making as many of those modes and many of those types of trips as attractive as possible. And to the extent that we can measure that, like walking to transit or, you know, linking trips or whatever it may be, we want to try and, and measure that really in all the scenarios, but particularly that one, since that's the focus of, of that scenario. Director Stolzman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So this, this work is very important, and thank you very much for working through this and um, coming to the board and, and trying to model all this for us going forward to be able to plan. It, it is, like I say, very important work. Um, I, I had some questions last time, and I still unfortunately feel like I have the same questions. So the, the last scenario, the regional jobs housing balance emphasis, and really some of the other scenarios, I guess I just need some additional background information, and maybe it's census data, or maybe there are white papers on it, but this is one of those things that I, f I read in the paper that all of our communities struggle with this. It's not like this is one area, even places in the region that I couldn't, like even Castle Rock. I mean, I, I can't even imagine that they're having some of the conversations that I'm reading that they're having, right? And I'm like, oh, wow, this is a regional, this is a regional issue, it seems, if the newspaper is reporting correctly. Um, so I, I need some additional information to understand. I, I think what we're saying here is that if we put more houses next to where the jobs are, that the people who work there will live there. But I need some additional information to understand why we think that's true. Because we add houses, and then people do wonderful people do live there. And we have more jobs than we have residents in Louisville and in Boulder. Um, and it just there seems to continue to be a persistent disconnect when we add new housing as to who lives there versus who works there. And a lot of it has to do with market forces and costs of living. And there are so many factors. Um, school districts, people, people make their housing choices for a lot of reasons. It could be family. It could be maybe they've always wanted to live on a farm. Maybe they, I mean, there are, there are just so many choices. And I don't have enough information to understand how we're evaluating this. And, and if it, I'm, I'm not trying to be, um, just ask questions to ask questions, but I don't know how we know if we add more houses next to jobs that people in those jobs will live in those houses. So I guess I need additional information on that. Sure, um, and, I, and I appreciate the question because it's, it's a really good question. So let me try and clarify on this one in particular. So first of all, this is not a community-based analysis because we're very sensitive to the fact that you can't, nor would you want to try to achieve that balance necessarily individual community by individual community. This has to be sort of a regional analysis, right? Um, we also know that um, ultimately people will choose where they want to live and where they want to work, and there's a lot of factors that go into that. Some of those we can model, and some of those, frankly, we can't. We, you know, if you want to live in Boulder and, lurk, and work in Castle Rock, you might do that, and you might even do that in this scenario. The point of this scenario, and this is what I want to clarify, this isn't so much about putting housing and jobs closer together with the intent that you will live in the house that's closest to the nearest job and you will work in the job that's closest to your house, right? That maybe some of that might happen, but that's not, that's not necessarily the point of this scenario. The point of this scenario is by putting more jobs 
and more housing closer together across the region as a combined transportation land use strategy. Is it possible, and this is a question we want to know, is it possible that when you look at it cumulatively across the region, that some people might live closer to where they work than they might otherwise or that they do today? And will that show up on regional travel statistics? So this is not about balancing in Louisville or balancing even in one part of the region. This is about if we try this as a strategy across the entire region, will we see any sort of uh, implications or benefit in terms of travel patterns? Okay, Director Strzok. Um, yes, you know, I'm kind of looking at a crystal ball here, and I'd like to see someday where the uh, big employers and, and the big developers would work together and, and make all-inclusive communities uh, where the people could live and, and ac have access to services and stuff and be able to walk to these things uh, without driving all the way across town. Um, I would like to see that someday. I would like to see both partners uh, bring to the table the other person. I think it would help quite a bit in the future. Yeah. Thank you. I make a comment to that? <laughs> it's funny that we have those conversations in Arvada, but it always feels like the residential developers don't like the commercial developers, and they always say one or the other is not doing well, so you need my product. And interesting what you're asking for people to come together and collaborate. When I find it, in our, at least in our community, how difficult where residential area will say, no, I need the 600 acres for residential, but you know, in, it, commercial is dying. It doesn't work anymore. And you hear the flip sometimes. Comment. Land use is always fun. Uh, Director Shaw. Thank you. I, I was just curious if we have a good understanding currently of, um, let's say, a household that has um, two adults and a millennial in the basement. So that's three people who work, right? And how how often, <laughs> or yeah, maybe two. <laughs> how, how often do those three people work in the same community today? And, and I think that might give us a little bit of insight into future modeling, even if there are more companies and more homes near near businesses. Does that mean that you know husband is going to work in the same community as the wife and the kid? <coughs> I I I'm just maybe a little skeptical of the ability to model. Yeah, so I'm going to phone a friend on that one. <laughs> <laughs> Me? Uh, hello, I'm Steve Cook, uh, Manager of Transportation Modeling and Operations. That is the toughest thing in modeling, Director Shaw. That's a great question because our model does try to replicate that. Now, not for people with an actual name and address, but we actually have within our model, working with Brad's team, every person in every household in a synthetic way, so it's not the real person, so, so don't get big brother scared here or something. Like that. <laughs> and we have those exact kind of things in there, and that is what is so hard to predict in the future. Now our model right now is currently, um, puts a lot of emphasis on a household travel survey we did back in 2010. And next year, working with the state, there's gonna be a statewide household travel survey and it's not only gonna be like hard copy writing in a diary of how you travel every day from a sample of households, but it's gonna be using cell phones, um, other electronic devices and things um, for uh, people who choose to participate in this. That's gonna really shed a, lo a lot of light on what you just mentioned there. And that's probably one of the biggest things that uh, makes uh, D Director Stoltzman's goals and our goals too of, of you know, the shorter trips and things, is the household makeup changing. Sometimes predictable, okay, your children are gonna age and get a little, a little older, sometimes unpredictable. Son moving back, or, no, you're not my son, Brad, but. <laughs> <laughs> well, my, millenn hey, yeah. son. my millennial son moving, moving back, and so many of those things are unpredictable, and then, but if you have to be in that household and the person works 
20 miles away, but they have to move their household <laughs> for financial. So very good question, but we are going to really be hitting that uh, in about a year with even better data uh, to try to get better predictions of that in the future. Thank you. Director Sandrin. Thank you. I don't really have a question. I'm just going to comment. We had this presentation last week at um, our uh, regional forum, and I really just want to say thank you to the staff, especially Ron and Jacob. They took the time. A lot of us were new. We weren't in on this process the first time. So this is my second full year. We came in at the beginning of the TIPS process. That was confusing coming in as a new council member, and then getting this presentation after the fact didn't really make any sense. But they took the time and really made sure that we understood and answered our questions, described it in lots of different ways, and made sure that we understood. And I think that's just a testament to the great staff that you have. I mean, this isn't, they're not the only staff members that do that, anything that we have questions about. So thank you. It makes a lot of sense now seeing it again a week later. Um, but I really appreciate the work and the time that you guys take to make sure that we understand as well. I appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, Director Partridge. Mr. Uh, Jacob, I know this is always such a big lift, and I know my staff reached out to you in October regarding some of the inconsistencies of where we see growth and is and where we see growth being projected. So I know you have a big lift, but I hear the concerns of my staff on that. So <clears throat> do you have a plan to really reach out to each individual jurisdiction, check with them frequently, about land use, uh, you know, the land use changes. I'll give you an example here. There's an unincorporated area, Douglas County, roughly 750 sites. It was incorporated up to about 2,500 just last week. That increased 1,500 more. So it happens so quickly. And I'm wondering, do you have that where you're going to actually check? Because I'm hearing some of the, the staff a little bit of frustration. We're trying to get a hold of you. We haven't got a response back. Uh, so I appreciate that question, Director Partridge. I'm actually going to ask Brad to answer it. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> so Hi, Brad. Oh, that was good. You already <laughs> used up your phone, a friend. <laughs> Got the gist of it. Um, so just uh, Brad Calvert, Director of the Regional Planning Plan and Development Division here at Dr. Cog. So uh, uh, Director Partridge's question is really kind of in my shop's wheelhouse. Uh, that is something that we work with a lot of partners, not only the state demographer office, but um, your, your staff locally uh, to do what, and I hate to use a jargony term, but a small area forecast uh, for the entire Denver region out to, in this case, to the year 2050. Uh, so I, I think Jacob uh, alluded, it, alluded to this um, sort of early in his talk. Um, we, I would call the, the, the forecasting work that we've done so far really preliminary. Um, we have been doing a lot of work, uh, sort of change our modeling approach, and I won't get into the weeds in part because I probably couldn't explain it all that well. Um, so there was that that we needed to run through the model as well as actually going out to the year 2050. The, the, the existing forecast goes out to the year 2040. So uh, we reached out to Douglas County and other folks to get a very early uh, set of comments um, on the forecast, but in parallel to the scenario analysis work that Jacob is talking to you about uh, this evening, as well as sort of the, the larger conversation around the regional transportation uh, plan, there is a parallel conversation that is about making sure that there is a shared set of growth assumptions related to local uh, growth priority areas that are included in the assumptions that this board understands uh, as you make informed decisions about uh, those investment decisions that are maybe spelled out in the in the RTP. So we understand that we the very first version that folks have re reacted to in kind of that September October time frame, we knew they probably weren't going to be very good. Uh, our commitment is to consistently make them better, uh, and we have sort of two um, uh, slots of time over the next uh, year or so where we will continue to have. Uh, that uh, outreach to your staff to make sure that our assumptions are reflecting uh, your own planning priorities uh, locally. So that is in many ways almost like a year-long conversation that we are very uh, early in. So, and again, I probably heard half the question, so if I completely didn't answer it, we can start over. Dir Director Teal. Uh, actually, um, uh, unsurprisingly, Commissioner Partridge actually asked my follow-up question, and uh, Brad, uh, I appreciate that answer that, uh, that addressed my concern. All right, thank you. Director Odorizio. 
Uh, as we continue to look at different uh, methods and practices, I think the only thing I want to make sure that we keep in mind is that we don't systemically keep those that are uh, communities that tend to be underrepresented or are, um, tend to be struggling to kind of break out and improve. Um, what the challenge that I think we're seeing across the board is that whether you're talking RTD or CDART or even sometimes so, some of the things that we do in certain areas is that that we we build the criteria in a way that favors those who already have infrastructure. And I think it's important to remember that there's still a lot of communities that are trying to catch up and that we don't systemically keep those that are down always down. And so I'm gonna just ask that this board, everyone kind of keep that in mind because uh, when we're facing these issues and you're looking at funding, to go from this place or this place, a lot of times I think that we're finding that, well, we're gonna put it where there's already infrastructure. Well, and that makes some sense, but then at the other point, then you're never gonna catch up for those who don't. So I just ask that as we look at these policies, <laughs> that we uh, keep in mind that there are a lot of communities out there that are trying to improve and that we make sure that we don't systemically keep them down. Yeah, thank you, Director Odoricio. Um, so one of the things that we're doing throughout the planning process, including the scenario work that I'm talking about tonight and also relating to the question about uh, transparency and public engagement, we've convened a youth advisory panel, which we've never done before to have our, uh, these are high school youths from across the region sort of engaged in our planning process. But we've also engaged what we're calling a civic advisory group. And this is a group of folks who kind of are those populations that you're describing, the low income, you know, minority, transportation disadvantaged type folks that, you know, frankly, we do have trouble reaching and we want them more involved in our process. We're gonna bring them along as well. They're gonna meet bi-monthly. Part of our plan is that whether it's scenario work or any other component of the plan, that we wanna feed that, you know, feed those, that work through those groups and get their input on the front end so that they can help shape some of the work that we're doing, you know, before it comes to our committees and before it comes to you. So we're very sensitive to that and we want to do that. Director Flynn. Uh, thank you. Uh, Jacob, what, this is a kind of a wild card, but. Uh, especially under the land use components, the regulatory constraints. Are you able to model the impact of change, uh, radical changes such as what might be on the ballot next year to limit uh, residential growth to 1% in 11 front range counties? And we saw what happened in Lakewood and uh, you know there's a possibility that, that would pass. And I, I imagine that would exacerbate the problem or the issue of people being able to live near where they work because it would limit choices and limit pricing. Can we model that? Yeah, so we talked about that, Director Flynn, at the, you know, back in October, November, as we were formulating these ideas. Uh, we talked about whether, you know, we should try and do that as a scenario. We kind of decided that we didn't think it quite fit as a separate scenario, but it is something that we can sort of look at on the side in terms of the potential effect of that. And Brad, I don't know if you want to add to that answer, but. I uh, also understand the reality that it's kind of an apples and oranges. Um, one of the things that we will walk into is a shared set of assumptions about total population and employment growth um, in the region throughout uh, these scenarios. And really kind of the land use side is rearranging those assumptions a little bit. And if you really sort of tamp down the overall population and employment, you end up with kind of a different uh, conversation as Jacob was alluding to. So we just as staff were like, that it doesn't feel like we would be giving you as decision makers really kind of a, the best set of internet information to react to if we were pairing it or making it comparative to these other pieces. So it does feel like a separate on the side, but hopefully valuable conversation uh, to bring forward to you at a later date. Director Atchison. Well, one of the things back to all of us here is for at least the five years I've been down here, one of the things that we've always talked about is the data that Dr. Hat Cog has is only as good as the data that you give them. Your comp plans that you adopt or when you amend your comp plans and you increase density, if you're not giving that data to them, then they're not using it. And this is one of the things we talked about, the communication between anybody's planning department or who handles your comp plan changes. If you're not communicating that down here, we're behind the curve. But to Roger's point, you make a change, go from one density level to the next, did you send that data forward? We all have to be prevalent in that we understand that that data has to get down here so they can use it for the planning purposes. And if we don't get the data down here and we have bad numbers, we've got nobody to blame but ourselves. Director Dell. 
Yes. Um, I'd had to look through the depression. I see a depression or a recession coming in the next 15 years without a doubt. And that's why many cities maintain reserve, just like we used it here just a few years ago. And those who didn't have it were pretty sad. So what are we plugging in here in a regional job and housing balance for a recession or even a depression? So that's a AKA good. AKA <clears throat> Colorado Springs in the 80s. Yeah. Right. So that's a good question, Director. I think the short answer is that, you know, we're looking at 2050, right? And we anticipate that between now and 2050, many things are gonna change, both probably positive and negative. We're gonna go through these up and down cycles probably several times um, between now and 2050. So 2050 is indeed a snapshot in time, but we're looking at when you take the sort of cumulative effect of all of that up and down over time, where do we land at 2050? What do we think that that version of the future looks like? And that's kind of what we're gearing that towards, if that makes sense. Mr. X. Thank you, sir, very much. Great discussion on this this evening, and thank you all for that. Um, as an old transportation modeler myself, I always feel like I got to give somewhat of a disclaimer when it comes to modeling. Be careful in, in how we use that data, right? I mean, uh, Eric Sabina, who was a former modeler, Dr. Cog now at CDOT, um, I think he always summarized it very well. It's a model; it's not an oracle, right? So it is. It is. I mean, I think we have to be conscious of that when we see, start seeing some of the results and and the metrics that are used. That it's. I think, um, in relative terms to the other scenarios, it will be interesting to see the magnitudes of, of difference in some of those metrics. But um, you just have to be careful in how we ultimately use them. We're very sensitive to that. So, um, so just kind of FYI. All right, any other questions, comments? None, we'll move right along. Thank you very much for the robust conversation. Now we're up to item 14, introduction to the Dr. Or Denver Regional Climate Action Plan effort, attachment I, Mr. Rogers. <laughs> <laughs> Lovely day. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, I think. Um, so I've already introduced myself with Brad Calvert, uh, Director of Regional Planning Development uh, Division here at Dr. Cog. I'm actually really only going to kind of kick this off um, just to maybe provide a little bit of background. And in fact, some background already kind of came out of some of the previous uh, conversations. But but we have a, a colleague of ours, Jonathan uh, Wachtel from uh, Lakewood, that is actually kind of be your be your primary pre uh, presenter. He is their sustainability uh, manager. And I would just thank Jonathan. He had a, a busy schedule tonight and rearranged some things to be here. So we appreciate uh, you uh, doing that. Uh, and Robert is also Robert Spots, a colleague of mine here. Dr. Cog is here as well, largely to answer any questions that are maybe sort of technical in nature. So you might hear from a couple of us uh, as the pre presentation moves forward, or, or you have, if hopefully you have another robust uh, uh, conversation. Just so again, a little bit of background. There's there's a, a note in this uh, related to this in in the memo. Uh, we are one of four regions um, in the country that actually received technical assistance funding uh, to advance uh, regional climate um, action uh, planning. So we're we're happy to be part um, of that cohort um, and having interesting conversations with folks that are pursuing this in other parts of, of the country. Um, uh, as was sort of kind of came up in the, the earlier uh, 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 item, uh, as you all know, we have a set of regional uh, plan performance targets associated with the MetroVision plan, including uh, a, a, plan, a, a target and measure related to per capita greenhouse gas emissions in the transportation sector, a 60% reduction uh, in that over the last, over the next 30 years or, or so. So there is obviously a nexus to, to, to priorities uh, this board um, has set. Um, to kind of give you a sense of how Dr. Cog has been uh, involved in this, this is really a um, emerging partnership that many uh, stakeholders around the, around the region, including your staff, are involved with. Uh, we've really kind of supported it in a few ways so far. Uh, offered this meeting space to have a, a workshop back in October, uh, hoping to do that again in March as, as, as the uh, project advances. Uh, Robert has been, and his team have been really helpful in providing uh, data and analysis related to that travel model 
work that we were just talking about uh, to, to uh, the project team. And frankly, that's actually in some ways been really helpful for us. Uh, there are many, many jurisdictions in this region um, that are doing uh, climate work, very specifically around greenhouse gas emissions inventory. So over the years, we've fielded a lot of requests from your uh, staff to provide data that helps them in their work. So in some ways, we're kind of getting ahead of some of those, those future requests, uh, which, which is great. Um, so I'm sure Jonathan will kind of mention this uh, throughout his presentation, but I do want to emphasize this is an initial briefing on a project that is in its very early stages. So you should just know that. Uh, there is a lot of work in 2020 uh, that is still to come. Uh, and I will give sort of Jonathan some things that maybe get him off the hook, though I think he knows he's off the hook for some of this anyway. This is a stakeholder, partner-driven conversation. Uh, there are many, many conversations that will happen in 2020 that have not happened yet. Uh, so there's a good chance you could ask a question that, that Robert, Jonathan, or I don't know the answer to because there really haven't been conversations about governance or long-term sustainability of this work. Uh, the work in 2019 has really been more technical in nature and the conversation will advance in 2020. That is not me to say, don't ask questions. Questions that come up as part of this conversation are very instructive for not only us, uh, but your staff that are working um, on uh, this project. So let's let's have a good conversation, even if it's a, we can't answer that tonight, but we will write it down and, and, and ultimately um, integrate any questions, concerns, or observations you have uh, into the conversations that will continue into year uh, 2020. So with that, I'll turn it over to Jonathan. Great, thank you, Brad, so much. Um, and he covered so much of what I was um, trying to figure out how to express, so um, I can almost move to questions. No, I will. And it's also an incredibly <laughs> colorful room, so thank you um, for that. That makes this a little more lighthearted on a serious topic. So um, I'm Jonathan Wachtel, I'm the Sustainability Manager for the City of Lakewood. Uh, but my, I'm up here tonight on behalf of uh, more than a dozen of uh, the local jurisdictions who came together last October to kick off this um, opportunity to do regional climate action planning. And for a lot of us, this is really an exciting opportunity because uh, there's a lot of your communities that have started looking at tracking our greenhouse gas emissions, made some preliminary commitments, maybe even put some plans together. But for the most part, we really don't necessarily have answers or understand exactly what we need to do to follow through on those things. And we often lack the resources and the technical expertise. And so um, as we all kind of journey through trying to figure out what climate action looks like and what the vulnerabilities and risks that we have as communities uh, look like, um, it's such an obvious area where regional collaboration makes a whole lot of sense to really help um, move us forward. So um, to give a little background, I, that, that kind of gave you a little bit of background, um, but I'll, I'll set the table a little bit and then get into some detail about what this work is gonna look like, um, and then we can take some questions. So uh, to make sure we are all on the same page of what we're really trying to, to work towards is uh, clearly as we're trying to identify what we need to solve for as part of impacts from climate change. Um, it's fairly simple what's, what's happened. We've extracted fossil fuels and stored carbon and burned it and put it in the atmosphere and we're seeing the impact of what that has done to the changing our planet and to our climate and those impacts uh, are rapidly um, you know causing direct impacts here in Colorado and across the world um, the real question is how is that going to actually affect our operations our local governments um, our built environment here in Colorado and I think that um, the data is starting to to roll in we're both experiencing extreme weather events ourselves it's not just sea level rise for coastal communities or big hurricanes but we're seeing data and direct examples of how changing climate is impacting colorado uh, there's been a whole variety of studies done looking at this you know 20 of the first 21 years of this century have brought all kinds of record-breaking events and um, and shifts and so we're trying to wrap our heads around what that means for Colorado for the front range uh, heat is obviously one that we know is a big deal both a consistent increase in average temperature Colorado seen a two degree average increase in average temperature um, as a state over the last 30 years um, and extreme heat days and the number of extreme heat days are also evident we've also experienced an increase in our extreme weather events and I think what's really important to think about from 
uh, functional perspective of how we build and design and plan our region is that it's one thing to think about these really acute events, you know, uh, the floods of 2013 and how we um, enhance our emergency response or our preparedness to respond to those big acute events. Um, but it's also the incremental and kind of chronic shifts um, that are really have the potential to be difficult to manage. You know, what does that mean for our stormwater storage infrastructure capacity? What does it mean for how we design and build our actual roads? The number of freeze and thaw days, what is that going to actually do to our roads and bridges? Um, we might have an extreme and acute event like a large fire and there's health impacts of that smoke and there's loss of potential loss of life and property damage. But once that's done, we're also going to see kind of these chronic long-term impacts of what that does to sedimentation and to erosion in our soils and things like that. So um, one of the big challenges here is understanding all of those vulnerabilities and risks. The good news is there's a lot being done, and there's a lot of solutions that are out there. And I think you can look really clearly at the renewable energy space as a great example of where technology and research and policy have all come together to really help um, start to make an impact. Uh, the costs of renewables coming down, cleaning our electrical grid is providing really great opportunities to reduce our emissions and have the co-benefit of adding resiliency. Um, to have distributed energy systems with battery backups so that if we do have emergencies, um, you know, everything doesn't go offline at once. And so um, there's a lot of great technical solutions. And at the same time, there's been a lot of study and collaboration um, to work towards identifying other opportunities to start solving problems. I mentioned the 2013 floods. You know, directly after that, um, more than 30 communities got together with help of federal grants. So in this spirit of regional collaboration to learn from what happened, identify maybe some of the factors that could have been planned for, um, and to try to understand what we could do to try to mitigate and reduce the severity of future events like that. Um, and so that was a really good starting point. And another important step to wrapping our heads around this is obviously understanding um, what our contribution is to the problem um, and where our emissions come from. And so, uh, as Brad mentioned, a lot of our communities, um, dozens at this point, have conducted greenhouse gas emission inventories. Uh, we rely on the Dr. Cog organization quite a bit for that data, uh, for a lot of those pieces of data. And what we're actually seeing is as the grid gets cleaner, the percentage and the attribution of our emissions coming from build, the building sector and from the energy sector is um, is dropping and we're starting to see the transportation sector really become the number one contributor to greenhouse gas emissions. So there's definitely um, an overlap with a lot of, of your work um, and Metro Vision's goals with this. Um, maybe before I move on, I mean, one of the real benefits of having this opportunity to do some of this work regionally is in the space of this kind of data and tracking. Um, you know, each individual city trying to collect data and assess its greenhouse gas emissions inventory is, is um, useful for those jurisdictions, but none of these issues really stop at our borders, just like most of the things you, you work on. Um, and so we spend a lot of time trying to line up our methodologies, divvy up who's responsible for which vehicle miles, which airport trips, uh, what portion of the wastewater treatment plants et cetera. Um, and so taking a regional approach um, has been something that we've been discussing um, as colleagues across our different um, cities and, and counties and other jurisdictions uh, for a number of years. And so this opportunity that we'll lay out uh, what's going on now is really exciting. Um, it's solvable, and the typical approach really is, at least as a, as a framework, this is all solvable, and really the you don't need to get into too much detail here, but the basic idea is we need to understand the contribution to the problem and stop the spill, so to speak, reduce our emissions, and at the same time, understand our unique vulnerabilities and risks and figure out how we're gonna adapt and redesign um, our cities and our, and our regions to be able to address that. And so we typically look at that as mitigation, reducing the greenhouse gas emissions, and adaptation, uh, making sure we're designing for a resilient, resilient future. There's an extra topic on the slide, and that's geoengineering, and that's a little bit more of the kind of technology to the rescue concept. Um, are we able to start sequestering carbon and those types of technologies? But that's really not a practical, uh, immediate solution for our cities and counties. 
right now. So we're really looking at that mitigation and adaptation and ideally find looking for solutions that can achieve both at the same time. Reduce emissions and make us more resilient. So as many of you know, local governments have really been kind of spurring this activity um, globally and nationally and locally. Uh, U.S. cities and counties are very active globally. Um, you know, close to 800 million people are represented by cities that have made commitments to um, taking on climate action. Uh, dozens of cities here in Colorado in various forms um, and hundreds of cities around the United States, uh, probably thousands that have done it, hundreds that are um, kind of formally networked. And typically what this looks like for a city is we start with some type of commitment um, relevant to the opportunity we have before us is a uh, commitment that started as a compact of mayors and now is a global covenant of mayors for climate and energy. Uh, but there's been all kinds of different commitments. Many of you have probably been bugged by different organizations asking your jurisdictions to commit to, to something. We're all very familiar with that. So that's the first step. The second is to measure, you know, where are our emissions coming from? Where are we right now with um, you know, percentage of renewable energy and transportation emissions and all that kind of stuff, and then to start a planning process. And none of this is groundbreaking. It's a similar type of process that you should go through for most planning, execute, and then evaluate. Uh, the challenge is that cities all over the, the state and our region here um, have oftentimes taken that first step and maybe are taking the second, but don't necessarily have the resources or the expertise to continue down that path, it can be quite a bit of a challenge. Um, oh, I think this was an older slide. Um, we have another one that has a map with you know the 30 plus uh, cities that have made different types of commitments in the Dr. Cog area. I actually went through the member list earlier today and more than 20 I know specifically have either adopted goals, uh, conducted a greenhouse gas emission or have some type of sustainability entity, whether it's a uh, individual for the whole organization or some kind of formal board of citizens or um, in the case of some of our communities, more robust built out staff. So this work is happening all over our region and, um, and that's where this opportunity came in. So the Global Covenant of Mayors for Climate and Energy uh, is an international effort of um, cities that um, strongly supported in the European Union, but also here in the United States to uh, take firm steps to not only commit to uh, climate action, but then to um, start planning and coming up with strategies. And so uh, there was an opportunity to uh, have regions apply. So rather than having seven, eight, nine cities individually making these commitments, uh, they came up with a model and some technical resources um, to fund regional approaches. So uh, Denver is one of four uh, that were selected in the United States. Um, and we're here to give you this update because you're the experts in the benefits of regional collaboration um, and you're a natural venue to help uh, us think through how to take a regional approach and we've been um, lucky to have Dr. Cog's support so far in helping us convene and have meeting space. Uh, we really appreciate that. Uh, the benefits of a regional approach, I probably don't need to get into too much detail. Um, I think for a lot of our communities, and I think the reason I was asked to, to represent uh, our coalition of communities working on this is that I know very well uh, for the city of Lakewood that we benefit both from uh, helping, getting help from Denver, from Boulder, from Fort Collins, from cities that have really been working at this for a long time and have a lot of staff expertise and experience. Um, but also we've been doing it just long enough that we've been in a position to also uh, support some of our neighbors and communities that are just getting started in this journey. And so uh, I think we have a good perspective of what um, the benefits can be with um, a regional model of, of helping kind of move everybody forward and share and share resources. So. Um, the opportunity here is to leverage the expertise we have, uh, add additional um, expertise, benefit from economy of scale, um, reduce the replication of similar works and share best practices and all those, those opportunities. And of course, realize a lot of co-benefits. Uh, the really great part about some of this work is that m most of the time, the strategies and the ideas not only help um, uh, with related directly to greenhouse gas emissions and climate, but also to most of the other adopted goals in our comp plans as, as, uh, um, as we look at these systems. So there's tons of co-benefits. 
Uh, so what this is looking like is an inventory of our regional greenhouse gas emissions as step one, along with an assessment of our regional climate risks so we can really identify what the future may look like um, from climate impacts uh, in the front range, and then to develop a specific plan uh, to reduce those greenhouse gas emissions and address those vulnerabilities, um, and then compile those strategies so that uh, there's some common approaches, best practices, and resources for all the um, jurisdictions to work from. Uh, the idea here is similar to the approach, you know, we've, we looked at the model that Dr. Cog uses for MetroVision and, and think that's a good model, you know, be prescriptive um, for individual sit or not, don't be prescriptive that every individual city uh, or jurisdiction needs to implement these strategies, um, but also don't limit the opportunities for cities to implement these. So really come up with this menu of best practices and opportunities that communities can um, can leverage to, to move things forward um, based on their own needs, their own assessment of their uh, vulnerabilities and risks and their own level of resources. Um, and of course, it's stakeholder driven. Uh, our first workshop not only included local governments, but also uh, regional transportation district and Excel and representatives from the airports and other stakeholders. And uh, we talked a lot at that about expanding that stakeholder holder group because um, the impacts that we're looking at affect you know, everything from economic development to transportation. Uh, the commitment that we've made as part of this uh, opportunity and the technical support that we've got is to do an inventory every two years, and that's similar to what a lot of the cities had already committed to. Um, and so in a lot of ways, this will help streamline um, our work uh, that this, for those cities that are doing that. and potentially help uh, the staff here at Dr. Cog from having to field individual requests at random times from all of our jurisdictions for the data we need to be able to, to assess those. Uh, it would then include setting an ambitious target to reduce greenhouse gas emissions for the region. Uh, maybe a year ago, that might have felt like a bigger lift, but now that we've got um, some targets set at a state level, uh, it's probably um, less of a you know difficult challenge as far as trying to figure out what that looks like. Uh, then develop a climate action plan and then work to, to address those risks. So I felt like I probably repeated a lot of that a, a few times. The next step, um, so I can wrap up and give you back some time here, is that uh, we're going to be completing those, the first step of those greenhouse gas emissions uh, inventory and conducting the climate risk and vulnerability assessment uh, in hopefully in January. Uh, we're gonna have a next round of stakeholder uh, workshops uh, this spring. Um, and our hope is to really finalize the first version of the climate action plan uh, by next fall. Uh, so it's very exciting. We've got a roadmap in front of us at this point for how to kind of do this initial launch. Uh, what we don't know is how we're going to kind of govern this over time, uh, where this might live, uh, how we're gonna make sure that the results of this first lift where we've got um, support from various organizations and some funding and technical support uh, how to make sure that's not a one-time, kind of one-and-done effort, but that it, it will be able to be sustained. And so um, we haven't figured that out. That's in our to-do list. And of course, as experts in that, we'd welcome suggestion or wisdom on, on maybe approaches we could use to make sure this is, has some um, continuity going forward. Uh, so with that, I think I can wrap up my comments. And if there's any other questions, I'll be happy to try to field them or pass it back to Dr. Cogstaff. Thanks. So before I accept any questions, I do want to recognize Executive Director Will Tours in, in our audience back there. He's the Executive Director of the Colorado Energy Office and a Dr. Cog JVC Award winner. So I figured before we kick off, this might be an interesting topic for him to ask some questions or give us some insight or share your thoughts. Yep, there you great. go. Well, thank you very much, and it's great to be back with the Dr. Cog board. I spent 15 years on the board, and it feels like home to be back here. So thank you for the opportunity. So I just want to say that it's it's wonderful to see this regional effort moving forward, and want to give a little bit of context from the state perspective. As I think people are aware, last year the legislature <laughs> passed House Bill 1261 for the first time setting legislatively adopted targets for greenhouse gas emissions reductions in Colorado. So we now have the 
goal of a 26% reduction below 2005 levels by 2026, a 50% reduction by 2030, and 90% by 2050, really in line with the reductions that science says are needed in order to maintain a stable climate going forward. The, the Energy Office has been tasked by Governor Polis to lead a multi-agency effort that in many ways is analogous to the effort that you are working on at the regional level to uh, update the greenhouse gas emissions inventory for the state, to uh, model where we're headed under a business as usual scenario, and try to understand the gap between the goals that the state has set and where, we are, where we're headed under the current set of uh, legislation, regulatory actions, and actions being taken by local governments to quantify that gap and then to stand up a set of potential strategies for uh, addressing that gap going forward. We will be working with a set of consultants uh, over the spring and summer modeling potential strategies. There will be a stakeholder engagement process throughout the, throughout the spring and summer with the idea that on about the same timeline as this regional effort, by you know, in the middle of next fall, we hope to be able to return to the governor and the legislature with a set of recommendations for strategies to achieve the goals that the state has set. Happy questions about that. I, I think that the uh, description uh, that transportation and buildings are very important elements uh, of being able to achieve these emissions reductions is right on target. A, electricity generation is our largest source of emissions. Transportation is second. Buildings is third. We're on track for transportation to probably be the largest source of emissions in the state as soon as 2020, largely because the electricity sector is cleaning up so rapidly. And when we think about the sorts of changes that are possible in the transportation and the building sector, while the state certainly has an important role to play there, many of the relevant <laughs> decisions are made by local governments and by regional planning entities like Dr. Cog. So we're you know, very interested in the opportunities for collaboration going forward there. So thank you very much for the opportunity to speak and again, very excited to see this effort moving forward at the regional level. Thank you, any questions for uh, Mr. Tour? All right, you're off the hook. Oh, you do, Mr. Venom. Actually, I just, I just wanna make a comment and that is, uh, universally, uh, people speak as if it is an established fact that human activity is the exclusive cause of climate change. Um, that's impossible because in the Noan period, the Roman period, and the medieval period, uh, the air temp was substantially higher than it is today, and none of those people drove CAD SUVs. Uh, additionally, uh, the current carbon dioxide level in the world is 403 parts per million. Historically, that is extremely low. Um, <coughs> people, scientific people that uh, oppose the, the idea that climate change uh, is man-made receive absolutely no audience because of the bias of the media. So if you want to really uh, look at the topic on a fact-based uh, observation, I would encourage you to read Gregory Wrightstone. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Yes, Director Shaw. I, I think it would be helpful to make sure that we define um, <coughs> what is green or clean energy. The, the reason I say this is that if you ask Excel Energy, they they are looking to clean electricity, but they don't want me to throw my furnace and my hot water heater and my stove, my dryer, and my fireplaces into the landfill just yet. They're okay to stay with natural gas. So if you talk to other people, they're talking about doing away with the natural gas and going to fully electric homes and so so forth. So I think that at least um, as part of our definitions, it would be helpful to to specify kind of what our target really is. 
Um, I was curious also, and this is um, similar to Director Vidim's comment, but um, have we looked at, and not saying we don't have a problem to address, but I'm curious if there were other uh, uh, 30 year period since like nine, or 1880 when uh, the average temperature uh, ro rose by two degrees. I'm just curious. I One second. Do we yes. have any questions for Mr. Tour? No. Okay. I thought we were done You're with that. You're excused if you want. Otherwise, Sorry. it can get very dangerous in here. Well, th thank you very <laughs> yeah, much. Thank you very much. So, and, and did want, before I left, just to introduce Christine Berg, who is former mayor of Lafayette, who has recently joined the Energy Office as our new director or senior advisor in local government policy, who will be working um, to support local government efforts on clean energy and climate. So. Reach out to Christine if you'd like to work with the Energy Office. Thank you very much. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you. Okay, going, going back to uh, Director Shaw, but then I have Director Partridge or Director Williams and Director Partridge. Holzman Director and Brockett and <laughs> Bagel and Jones. And we'll just everybody. <laughs> so, Director Shaw, do you, you want to? Is there a question for? No, just a, a request to clarify what the definition is of green or clean energy and curiosity about whether or not there have been other uh, times in Colorado's weather history, 30-year periods, where the average temperature has gone up or down uh, considerable amounts. I, I, I don't dispute that it may be up during the last 30 years. Um, but there were other periods in time that seemed like there were very cold spells followed by warmer and that they reversed. Again, not that we don't have issues that we can't address, but I, I hesitate to, to rely on something that looks only at the last 30 years and doesn't look at a longer span of time. Okay, Director Williams. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, just want to kind of talk in support of this. We had a number of colleagues attend the workshop in October, found it to be very beneficial. Uh, Denver is standing up a climate action office next year, and resources like this and this regional cooperation and, and just the great resources is going to be critical for the success of that office. Thank you. Director Partridge. Mr. Chair, I have some questions for Brad, but I first want to start. Uh, I think we're going to have to get party hats and, and whistles if we're going to have a discussion on climate change, global warmer, global cooling, whatever you want to call it. It's kind of like what an attorney, when you employ, uh, hire one attorney, you employ two. It's kind of like the same thing with scientists. You ask one scientist a question, you're going to have another one give an answer to. So uh, as I say, uh, in Colorado, we know what climate change is. You don't like the climate, wait five minutes, it'll change. <laughs> so I'm not getting to, I'm going to get in discussion any further on climate, but my questions really are for Brad, and it's to say I think we really uh, I'm a little shocked at this. Uh, being this has come to us as an, just an informative piece. Sounds like this came about sometime earlier in the year. So I have a lot of questions about how did this funding come about? Where who is the funding from? Was this a board direction to accept the funding? And regarding that workshop, I just think it was very interesting. That was not all encompassing. It was not the board. I think it should be board if we're going to do anything. Brad, there's a lot of questions on this. So if you could answer those first, and they could have some follow-ups. Sure. So the, the, the most important point that I would make is this is not a Dr. Cog project, just, just to be absolutely clear. Uh, as both Jonathan and I alluded okay, to. Uh, Brad, I'm going to get a little excited about that because I see the, the, what was presented to us was uh, something that said action, commitment, talked about Metro Vision, not quite like Metro Vision, Metro Vision. So I got some concerns. I just would just answer the questions, please. Uh, well, again, uh, the funding basically comes from uh, the Global Covenants of Mayors uh, in the EU uh, and is directed to uh, those four regions. Uh, that that were uh, uh, mentioned on the on the slide. So again, it's it's not funding that touches Dr. Cog uh, whatsoever, um, as Jonathan sort of alluded to. 
Um, really, as the stakeholders, including local governments around the region, began to have conversations about how do we take this local conversation and, and try to make more progress regionally, how do we do that? And Dr. Cog became a natural partner really to host uh, the convening in October and really Robert's work to sort of work with them to make sure that they have regional uh, data from, from the travel model has largely been our role uh, to date. Um, the notion of sort of this idea of commitment, uh, Director Partridge, um, there is an expectation that comes with the funding that the regions will make some sort of commitment. There are multiple paths to get to that commitment. Uh, it could be individual local governments making commitment to pursue uh, the climate action uh, planning. It could be a collection of local governments uh, making that commitment, or it could flow through an organization in our, in our uh, region through Dr. Cog. There has been no decision or even, even that group of stakeholders has not decided the path that makes the most sense uh, to advance this work uh, regionally. So this was to give you a very, very early preview in part to, to, to surface uh, some of those concerns that you might have. So this funding comes from the European Union. Mm -hmm. and that's where that global mayors really comes out of is the European Union. So there was funding. And if that funding came to this region, who received that check? Uh, it, it is largely supporting uh, technical resources that are that are actually and like for instance we have a consultant team the region has a consultant team uh, based out of California that helped run uh, the workshop in October um, so really it's it's really touching those technical resources that are providing uh, the resources to uh, Roger, our local communities to help. Did Dr. Cog receive the no, check? No. <laughs> no. Let me, let so me answer I'm kind this. of wondering, why is this being brought to us? And it sure appears that it's coming forward to a, a board decision. And so I think we really got to be more clear on this fu whole funding mechanism, what you're asking. And it does not seem that it is very many jurisdictions that are signed up to this. And that's why I'm wondering, why is it brought to the whole Dr. Cog 58 member board when this is the first we really heard about this. I've got a lot of concerns right. about this. I think we all should. Mr. Rex. Well, let me, let, me, let me try to address that as, as best of I know. So the grant, the grant was in part, um, was received by the uh, City County of Denver and City of Boulder or City County of Boulder? Or, or County of Boulder. <laughs> I, think, I think it was the City of Boulder. And um, they, once, once they received that, they reached out to us to provide some additional resources with regards to data and those types of things to, to, help, to help, you know, fund kind of the resource issue per, associated per with board that. direction, did you guys move forward or was that just oh, we do that the for, direction for, of the jurisdiction? Oh, for, um, yeah, f through, I through the wanna, jurisdiction. I just want to make I'm, that point, was not board direction <laughs> to move forward on that? Well, well we, well, we, well, we, well, we, well, we and, and what we ended up doing is fulfilling a technical a TA request from 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 our from, from one of our and two of our communities, right, with regards to data. So this briefing, and it truly is a briefing. This is not a Dr. Cog uh, initiative at all. Is to provide an information to you about a project that is ongoing in our region. And I think the uh, the, the concept would be if there are stakeholders that are, are communities that would like to participate in this endeavor, they're more than happy to do so. Outside of that, there is no ask of Dr. Cog. I just want to make that perfectly clear, because um, this is not a Dr. Cog uh, initiative, nor do we in, 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 nor do we expect that it would be. Appreciate that, Doug. Thank you. Uh, Director Stolzman. Thank you. I, I'm wondering if I should make Doug un uncomfortable too and ask him why it isn't a Dr. Cog initiative. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Um, so, so I, I just want to thank my colleagues. It, I do, th I do really appreciate a healthy discussion and debate. I recognize we're not always going to agree on everything, and I have a great deal of respect for my colleagues. But I do disagree with a number of the comments that have been made so far this evening, and I think it's important that disagreement is aired as well as agreement. So I just, I, I do want to put on the record that I disagree with a number of the comments and statements, and um, yeah, I think we could have a lot of interesting discussion about this and come up with areas where there is agreement and where there is disagreement and focus on the areas where there's agreement. I think we've all recognized that we're in a no, 
a known ozone uh, non-attainment area, and that has the potential to impact our federal funding for our transportation dollars. So I think we all recognize that there's a need to work on that issue and come together and figure out how we can address that and the health-related impacts that there are there. Uh, but I, I do think this discussion and trying to understand where we agree and disagree and trying to then vet out the different issues that we disagree on and see if there's more data or information that we could have that would help close the gap, I think that's very healthy and I, th I think that's a good thing to do. I do want to say the city of Louisville is very committed to this. Um, starting in January, our city facilities will be powered with 100% renewable electricity. Um, so I would encourage everyone else to do the same. You have a number of different options on how you can get there, whether it's installing um, additional solar panels, wind turbines, or just simply buying into some of Excel's programs that allow you to buy renewable electricity directly from our electric provider for those of us who are within Excel Energy. For those of you who offer a, your own utilities like Joan up in Longmont, you know, they're working really hard to, to, to um, get different types of energy. And um, in the long run, it looks like these different types of energy are going to cost our residents less money and provide us some of the, the solutions that we'll need to lower that ozone, to lower some of the other impacts. I do want to say, since um, Mr. Tour is here, or Dr. Tour, or whatever you want to say, um, <clears throat> that, you know, I, I, I can remember a few different times in my lifetime, um, like we can all remember when the chlorofluorocarbons were causing a problem in the ozone and everybody voluntarily stopped using them. Oh wait, that's not what happened. There were requirements and so there, there were mandates where people could not use them anymore and lo and behold, there were you know major reductions in the slowing of the ozone holes. Um, I can remember driving down to Denver when I was a kid to my grandma's house. She lived right across from the museum in Denver and you would see the brown cloud, it was, it was bad. It was this dark band and you would come out of the mountains and it was like, what is that pollution? It's horrible. And then everybody stopped um, voluntarily, right? Everyone voluntarily stopped with their particulate 10, um, their PM10 and, and reduced the amount of particulate in the air. Oh wait, there were state mandates that required changes that um, lowered the particulate matter and we don't have the brown cloud anymore. So there were changes to burning in people's fireplaces. There were changes to sanding on the roads and another of other changes to, to reduce the particulate matter in the air and the brown cloud's gone. So while I do want all of the locals to work on this and I do absolutely think there's a role, we need some state and federal help on this. And it really is the path to getting the kinds of reductions we need in the, in the time frame that we need. Thank you, Director Brockett. Um, thanks for that, Director Stolzman. That's very eloquent. I, I just uh, want, wanted to clarify too that I, I believe this funding, um, uh, this initiative, is not just out of the EU. It's also uh, jointly run by the International Council for Local Environmental Initiatives, which is an international organization, um, uh, and it's an organization of which uh, Boulder is a part of, as well as many other local governments all across the world. Um, anyway, so but ju just to uh, more of a technical thing. I'm excited that we're talking about this at a regional level. And I have a question for you on this about how we implement it, because there's a lot of us uh, who have local jurisdictions that are working on these things very hard, the um, inventories and climate action plans. And of course, um, as you, you referenced and, and, and uh, former director Tour was talking about, um, that the state has recently passed these uh, uh, targets as well. So uh, how do we keep this regional initiative in, uh, done in such a way that it coordinates between the local initiatives and the state initiatives such that we're kind of all working on the same page, kind of all comparing apples to apples and not kind of all doing it all in our own way? And is that one of the things that you're thinking about as you implement this? I, I mean, I think you, you nailed exactly what we're trying to do, uh, although I, I would preface that by saying I don't I don't think it's important that every participating uh, jurisdiction end up with the same set of goals or targets or even um, uh, strategies that they're going to implement I think the idea here is that um, we can all move forward together from maybe where we are and share uh, share the burden of collecting the data of understanding where we're starting from and coming up with like the type of strategies that communities might put in place to address these challenges uh, how each jurisdiction goes about that which of those makes sense um, should be up to those you know jurisdictions so it's yeah, really and, and just to, to clarify I totally understand that and I think it's part of what's a, a, a good approach with this is that you're talking about creating a menu of options that then different communities could you know, choose from, right? Correct. And it's more about helping to create a, a common language, right? So if you're uh, a community that wants to start a greenhouse gas inventory, 
how do you do it in a way kind of you know using a, a proven methodology something like that just a way to help people along so we're speaking kind of the same language as we talk about this stuff absolutely and, I, and you know some really um, easy examples that we've already experienced sharing collaboratively with jurisdiction are simply you know examples of what is working and what's not working as we work to try to do energy efficiency programs in our community would be a perfect example and when one community kind of can crack that nut and come up with a program that really does engage residents or engage business owners and is um, showing through data and you know uh, metrics that we're actually seeing energy efficiency increases high levels of participation and actually making some progress that becomes then a best practice that we're sharing you know, across our jurisdiction. So uh, rather than that taking place as one at a time with one jurisdiction finally um, asking that question and trying to find the community that maybe has an answer for them, um, this is a way to try to collect all of those um, strategies into more of a collective playbook. Right. And on an opt-in basis. Correct. Right. Yeah, thank you. Director Jones. Uh, thank you, Jonathan, for being here, and Director Tour, and uh, former Mayor Christine Berg. It's great to have you all here. Um, I guess I would just remind us all that I think it was 2016 we all unanimously adopted Metro Vision, which included a target to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions, and we all did that and agreed that that was a useful target, and that Metro Vision was this a vision for our region that we all could um, agree on. And so I think it's highly appropriate for staff to be looking for um, ways that we can, you can work collaboratively with all of us um, on a voluntary basis to further Metro Vision programs. So I'm, I'm not surprised that this came to the Dr. Cog table because I saw it in keeping with um, the work that we're asking you to do to help us work together on Metro Vision. And the fact that this is a voluntary um, effort makes it, I think, particularly appropriate for us to bring to the Dr. Cog table to see who all might want to work together on this. And I, I hope you would bring uh, additional opportunities like this. That having been said, Boulder County is, is quite supportive um, on, on working on this on the regional level. We are certainly active at the local level. I think I told you some of our story um, when I did my community highlight presentation, but um, the costs associated with local um, impacts from climate are something that are very um, front and center for Boulder County. We are still rebuilding roads and infrastructure from the 2013 floods. The price tag at the end of that day for the county government is going to be $250 million. We also did a, uh, uh, we hired a consultant to, to forecast what would be the local government costs associated with the changing climate. And they just looked at um, the cost of um, tr the transportation system maintenance. Asphalt turns out degrades faster under higher temperatures. Looked at infrastructure associated with bridges and culverts that would be impacted by uh, flash flooding events, which are projected to occur um, in the climate change forecast for Colorado. Looked at some of the impacts associated with heat waves and our ability to take care of vulnerable populations like our older adults. And the price tag is somewhere in the middle, uh, in, in the neighborhood of 100 to $150 million over the next decade or two, just for that small subset of impacts. So to us, it really addressing this issue is also about fiscal stewardship. Um, and, and community resiliency. And we would welcome the opportunity to work with other local governments to figure out how we're going to prepare um, our, uh, our infrastructure, our citizens to uh, address this and hopefully mitigate it as well. But since a lot of this change is already in the pipeline, we're gonna have to adapt to it. Um, and we'll need all the help we can get. So we look forward to working with partners on that. Uh, Director Walton. I, I, some of the comments that I was going to share, um, Director Jones has also just mentioned in terms of collaboration and whatnot. Um, in the city of Lafayette, I just want to voice support of the regional plan because, <coughs> excuse me, 
we you know have former expertise from um, former mayor berg and also our current mayor harkins is the president of the cc4ca and there's um there's dedication for the council right now to do some things we're coming up on an anniversary of a sustainability coordinator that we've hired so we're glad to be putting resources toward this with a pretty lean and mean staff we're doing a sustainability plan that will focus on energy and also um, waste diversion <clears throat> And we're also getting ready to do a transportation master plan that will, you know, some of these themes will focus there. And the other thing I would just want to underline too is um, one of our new council members um, is a science educator at um, NCAR, and we're excited to have him on board because we're taking on issues around oil and gas as well. So he has a perspective on that. Um, so it's it's interesting conversations that we're having, and I think that it really underlines the mitigation and resilience part of climate change and climate action that I think is important, particularly at a local level. So thank you for bringing this to us. Um, and I recall at our retreat, we talked about collaboration and the opportunity to bring topics to this board so that those who do want to get together and collaborate, share ideas, what's working, what's not, that we have this forum to create that opportunity. So thank you. Thank you. Any other comments or questions? All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right. Meeting's not going as fast as I normally do. Maybe we, maybe we need to ho, pull, ho, back ho. The, yeah, pull back the hot cocoa. Maybe we shouldn't do those anymore. We'll right there, yeah. All right, let's uh, move to committee reports. This is, yeah, committee reports. Uh, the first one up is uh, Director Jones' uh, report on the, the stack. So um, my mic keeps going in and out, so sorry about that. Um, I think last time I reported, we were having a kerfluffle. Um, <laughs> over uh, Senate Bill 1, Senate Bill 267, highway funds and which portion would flow to the Dr. Cog region. I'm happy to report that we won that fight thanks to CDOT and, uh, and um, the help of other partners and um, the Transportation Commission approved CDOT staff recommendations for Region 4 and Region 1 monies that come to Dr. Cogs. Somewhere, I think, $467 million for a lot of worthy projects. Um, at the last stack meeting, we got a preview of staff proposals for how the transit portion of those um, Senate Bill 1, Sen Senate Bill 267 dollars um, would be recommended for transit projects, again, in the Dr. Cog region, including things like new transit station near Castle Rock, park and ride in Idaho Springs, um, bus rapid transit in State Highway 119, um, $26 million for BRT arterials in the Denver metro area. I probably missed some, but um, happily, the stack voted to recommend a, a, um, a favorable nod to the Transportation Commission on those recommendations, and the Transportation Commission will vote tomorrow, so it looks pretty good. So yay on more money coming to Dr. Cog Region for transportation mobility. I think I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Uh, Director Atchison on the Metro Mayor Caucus. <coughs> we did not meet as a caucus in December. We will be meeting as a caucus for our retreat in January. However, our transportation groups continuing to meet for Metro Mayors. We are continuing to work with RTD, CDOT, the Governor's Office, and the Governor's Policy Group on what we're going to look at as possible statewide issues of trying to resolve transportation funding. If there's anybody that won the lottery, please donate. <laughs> uh, we still have not been able to, in five years, find a statewide initiative that can pass the voters. Don't have anything likely to come before election in 2020 that will. But, uh, but the work that the group is doing, especially the uh, subgroup from the policy committee from the governor, is trying to find something that might find a way to put additional funds in the transportation, but none of that has been successful. So. Thank you, Director Partridge on the Metro Area County Commissioners. I'm going to defer to Director Jones. She attended an event, so I will follow up and I just will make a note that January 24th will be the next MAC meeting and Epson County will Post this year, but Director Jones, her report. Uh, just that the Metro Mayor's Caucus and the Metro Area County Commissioners had their annual reception, holiday reception, um, just last week at the Denver Botanical Gardens, and the lights were 
just amazing. And, and the uh, camaraderie was good as well. Great. Uh, Jayla Sanchez Warren, you're up to talk about the advisory committee on aging. We did not have a meeting. We had, um, we took the funding subcommittee out lunch because they had to evaluate lots of um, contracts this year and that was it. Good, thank you. Uh, Mr. Rex on the Regional Air Quality Council. Thank you, sir, very much. I, I, I didn't attend the entire meeting. I, I, uh, that afternoon, the Colorado Cooperation, those that are associated with that, it's a, it's a great, great, I know Rich and I were at that. It's kind of, kind of like a quasi think tank type of thing that had, that met this uh, Friday and Saturday last, last week, so it was pretty cool. But anyway, RAC, um, we had a presentation from RTD just on their transit services. Uh, it was uh, one of two that was done the, the preceding month. It was uh, uh, folks up in Fort Collins gave a presentation about that. Uh, we talked about uh, um, and approved the, um, the 2020 budget and work program. Um, also approved the final draft amendment articles of, of incorporation. All right, thank you. Uh, E470 Director Dyack. Thank you, Chair. Um, we, we recognize a couple of our outgoing uh, board members, um, uh, Commissioner Conway from Weldon County, uh, um, Council Member Beacom from uh, Broomfield, served very well. Um, we also uh, addressed the 2020 budget with some revisions. Um, of note, we held the line on tolls on E-470 and we reduced three axle tolls. It's a pilot project for two years. We're trying to drive some more uh, traffic, um, truck traffic onto E-470 to kind of do our, our part to, uh, to help, help the network. Good. Right, thank you. Uh, Ms. White with CDOT, do you have an update for us? This is a new item I've asked to be put on here. We used to get it and kind of fell off, so I'd like it to be back on. Oh, you're not on. Uh, thank you. It's great to be on this agenda. Uh, Director Jones mentioned our probably most significant thing, which was the decisions around the use of the Senate Bill 267 dollars. Just to reiterate, we will have the commission voting on the transit dollars. Those were separated um, so that we could get through all those projects, so that will happen tomorrow. Um, I'm very delighted that we had our chair here tonight. I think that's the first time, possibly. Uh, and Dr. Cog history, at least that we all know, they have the Transportation Commission chair, so thank you for indulging that. A uh, couple other quick things. We do have a new chief engineer that's a really important role at CDOT. That's Steve Harrelson. He was an engineer who came through our ranks and had a, has a lot of experience on the mountain corridor, which is just great to have in role. And then speaking of mountains, we are tracking very closely the amount of snow we are pushing. We are at record levels, at least dating back to 2007 of the amount of snow we would have normally plowed at this early part of the year. So that's a, a concern for us as we look at our budgets and contingencies. We'll probably be reporting on that quite a bit unless the weather changes on us. Thank you. And uh, Mr. Van Meter on Fast Tracks. I'll take the liberty to discuss a few items of probable interest to this board that is not Fast Tracks related. I am totally open to that. Okay, so last night our board of directors approved the planning and environmental linkages document for State Highway 119. It aligns with what Director Jones was talking about just a little while ago in terms of aligning interests and party uh, parties between local government, CDOT and RTD. And the board reconfirmed or affirmed RTD's $30 million commitment toward transit improvements and enhancements in that quarter in that same action. Most of, most if not all of you know that David Genova submitted his retirement notification to the RTD Board of Directors to the chair on November 21st. His final day is January 20th. Um, at the December 3rd meeting, our board of directors elected to solicit applications both internally from RTD staff as well as externally and to advertise the opportunity for an interim GM anticipated to need to fill that role anywhere between four and 14 months. Applications are due December 23rd. I expect to see, uh, actually I won't see any of them, uh, any of them, but I expect that there's a lot of interest around this board. 
Okay. Um, <laughs> Which Bill, way? <laughs> I, I'm sorry, Bill. I didn't hear what you were saying. What were you asking? No. I'm sorry. sorry Bill. <laughs> of interest, uh, you know, around this table in that position. <laughs> you get to boss me around. Okay. Um, two last quick updates. One, reimagine RTD, our two year planning effort to look at both our system optimization plan, near-term optimization, that effort is well underway. Um, there's also the second piece, which is our mobility plan for the future. That work will start later in 2020. But that system optimization plan is underway. I look around this table and see a number of faces that are representing um, the, your interests on our advisory committee, which is a very large and diverse advisory committee. I appreciate that participation. I hope you would agree our first two meetings have set a good direction for the system optimization plan, recommendations for potential changes to rail and bus service and the route network with focus on four primary areas, social equity and community emphasis, improving service quality emphasis, reducing costs and improving, improving cost efficiency, as well as a geographic coverage emphasis. So those are the four primary emphasis areas that our board of directors have reviewed and not formally endorsed, but given us the go ahead, as well as a technical and advisory working group have generally given us um, support in that direction as well. And then finally, tomorrow night, our board of directors at a study session tomorrow evening at 5.30 will be reviewing the draft service reduction plan to address our operator shortage. So stay tuned. Information will be coming out tomorrow on that. All right, thank you. Informational items, uh, annual listing of projects that receive federal obligations, attachment J, as well as federal le legislative policy as attachment K, if you have some time to look at that. We will not have a work session because it, it's New Year's Day, and I don't think any of us want to work that day. <laughs> um, so we will be meeting on January 15th. Is there any other matters by the members? If not, happy holidays, be safe, stay warm. Thanks. Happy holidays. Okay,